Collective Podcast. Blessings. Matthew Thompson. Hello, Rocco. Um, so I'm really privileged and blessed to be here with this soul, Matthew Thompson, here on the Fully Reflective Podcast, which, yeah, the fully reflective as a term, it's like, why even is that? Because it's like, it, it points at light reflecting, or, you know, things get reflected, images get reflected, but when something's fully reflective, it kind of points to the potency of something's capacity to be reflective, you know, a, uh, kind of a foggy mirror you might be able to see the silhouette of something but that's going to reflect the clarity or the you know the exact image less than a pristine mirror so to speak so things reflect things other than other things um and you sir have uh man we met in 2014 i think yeah and within months i was playing benny banjo in your short film that was this wild west called wild wild west fan club wild wild west fan co fan co right right fan and, co. um and then we traversed into working on music videos and then um you know traversed into you know the deeper uncoverings of like spirituality and regulating trauma in the nervous system and, uh, and then I introduced you to a project my mom was working on. You became a super, you know, helpful conduit producer slash director for a project there. And um, man, I know you as a brother and I know you as an inspirer and I know you as a incredibly pristine mirror. That's literally what I would consider uh, a, a beautiful reflection of integration because um, this is all part of an opening soliloquy intro, but uh, recently you know it's it's really just hit me as like there's no such thing as spirituality there's just no such thing spirituality shouldn't be spirituality it's called reality and but we've become so hyper identified with the physical aspect of it that our spirituality is a thing and then our physicality is a thing so it's segmented but when someone's really embodied and integrated i think their spirituality is just their reality like you live it, you breathe it, it's in your art, but your art's not just your art, your art's your life. Your life is your work. Your work is, and that's a real crazy, rare anomaly, enigma, privilege, responsibility thing in the world. And we've, we've tuned in on that kind of, um, not just the responsibility of it, but the, the sword that that is to carry of being a storyteller and, you know, the, the ancestral alchemy that that is of telling story and then other people getting tuned into a thing that moved through you as a conduit and it moving through you and it's your job and responsibility to make sure it's tight in the nuts and the bolts and the dot dot dies and the cross t's and but then also helping other people tell their stories so um man thanks for sitting down and uh and uh, agreeing to dive into this uh portal with me um how are you feeling right now today on January 5th, 2022, what's present for you? What's alive for you? What's yeah. been a, um, maybe this will be the first baton. What's been a prominent topic or active theme or frequency in your past five days since this new year has begun? Wow. First, I just wanna reflect to you, you know, how, grateful I am to uh, not only be on this podcast, but to witness, you know, you being able to bring this into your sphere as another thing yet that you have dreamed about and wanted to manifest. And now it is made and being made and now being on the receiving end of it, because yeah, we've had many, many conversations over the last eight years of knowing each other, of, of dreaming of things we just feel like pulled to do, right? Not, not even not even pushing them sometimes but being but being pulled to them, you know, and there's a big difference to pushing towards something, being pulled towards something. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and yeah, you, you have helped me articulate in so many ways that sort of like unspoken thing of like, wow, you know, what is it about? Like, I've always loved the moon. That was the first thing that attracted the two of us when we walked out of LMU 
I'm going to answer your question. We were walking out of LMU that night. The first night we met, this is my alma mater in Los Angeles. And it was just this beautiful full moon that night. We just met, had like a two hour conversation. It was about a film that at the time I was trying to make a feature film. Hashtag romance. Hashtag romance, which is now called Magic Carpet Rides, which is, has its own. It hasn't stopped. It's uh-huh. none of these things ever stop until right. they see the light of day, I guess. But right. um, we were talking about that, met through Mitch Lindsay, and then and we just walked out and we just kind of, well, I think we just stopped and just looked up at the moon and kind of had like this beautiful, bromantic moment of looking at the moon and y- and you articulated so many things to me that I feel like I just kind of felt unspoken about the moon's power of reflectivity of light and that it doesn't glow, but that it reflects the light of the sun. And man, that had a huge, you know, impact in the way in which I felt very much like so much of the things that I try to make with my art is like, I just kind of repositioning mirrors on things and reflecting light on things. And so I have so much gratitude to you, but I just to bring it back full circle. Now you have a podcast about doing that exact same thing. So really, yes. man, powerful. Full, full uh, circle. Yeah, full circle. So uh, yeah, I mean, this, this 2022 feels like it's going to be just a great year. Like, and it doesn't matter what happens in the world. Like, I'm going to make it a great year. Like, it just feels inside of me like a good year. And then whatever else happens, I'll come meet it where it is. But it's like... Uh, you know, last year I did a lot of traveling. Um, I saw the world, you know, in many ways. And this year I was really happy to be able to like come back home in a literal like coming back home and a returning to sort of, you know, these projects that I've been developing for years now. A lot of them moving slowly, kind of quietly. Um, a lot of things being finished this year. And uh, I actually started the year in Joshua Tree, which is where I'd like to spend my New Year's. Uh, I spent one night with a group of friends that were really lovely, wonderful artists, a lot of them musicians, writers, thinkers, and we just were in Joshua Tree having an amazing hike, and I did one night on my own under the stars, which I try to do at least once a year, just go out by myself to just kind of listen, and and the sky was just really clear, and and I just kind of had like a sense of like, I feel, to answer your question, like grace, like peace, Mm -hmm. grace uh like something like the next adventure is around the corner and I got to gear up for it but also just really grateful for like all that uh is within my life at this moment including this moment so Mm. yeah Uh, on that I remember we were at my apartment off of Gordon Street in Hollywood I think it was January 2015 Mm. and you were talking about new year's resolutions. I don't know if you do resolutions anymore, but Mm -hmm. since that, and I remember your conversation was a kind of a peak reflection because it was like the resolution was like a masculine assertive moment of like, this is what I'm going to do as opposed to looking at or listening to what was already happening, which I started doing that since that moment, I would say that that was a reorientation for me. And I started being like, before I tell it what I want it to be, what's already showing me what it is? And I, I would love that if I just had a list somewhere like this year, like every year, there's like a word. Every year, there's a theme. Like yeah. there's a theme that hits us every year. Um, do you have, and then I'll share mine. Do you have a theme that's hit you for 2021? And do you have a theme that's started? You said grace. I kind of feel that for 2022. Mm-hmm. Um, Grace, would you say it's 2022 so far, obviously so far. And then do you feel like you had one for 21? Twenty-one was um, you know, I didn't I didn't set one word for 2021. 2021, I had a very um I was like walking into a big project that I knew I had to do. And so it was kind of a very like, uh, I need to do this well, you know, it was like, uh, and I think what it kind of boiled down to was um, like just being able to be like a witness. Like I just, my job was like, I was documenting 
things in seven different countries. And I needed to just be like a witness to the world in like the best, I just needed to listen and be aware. It was actually really, I have, now that I say it, it's kind of, it was a bit of both. Like I had, it was a hard year last year, of like a lot of like tough work. It was a lot of very solar work. We speak like solar and lunar work, right? It was very solar. Like I had to just, from me, like a lot of things that without the force of will wouldn't have fallen into place. But then also I had to do that to then be in a situation where I just had to listen as a documentary filmmaker and just like absorb what was being given to me with as clear of a lens as I could with this loving of a lens and then now try to take all that information and make a film out of it. So now now can you tell us real quick what your technique, I mean, we understand your, I understand, we already understand you're a filmmaker, documentary, traveling the world, it was about food, can give us a little sense or a couple about that? Yeah, yeah. So I'm a, I'm a writer, director, and, uh, and I've done a lot of different, you know, mediums, right? So we've made music videos together. Um, I've done feature films, I've done short films. Uh, I've done even documentaries with you. But this last year was a documentary. The last three years of my life actually was really heavy with the document documentary work. And that was, that was just, I was just pulled to that. But this past project uh, in 2021 was uh, about the future of food systems. So basically there was about 1500 applicants of food futurists. And these were people from whether they were like uh, educators at universities, actual farmers themselves, thought leaders, um, people that ran uh, NGOs who essentially took a look at a prompt. NGO? That was a, a non-government organization. Gotcha. Um, so these are like foundations or these are uh, you know things not directly related to, to the government um, that, that basically looked at uh, the question like, what is going to, what do we want our food system to look like by the year 2050? And that being a a year that, you know, the UN and other research institutions have said will be a year where the population could very well be 10 billion people. Significant kind of milestones have been sort of set globally as that year of like 2050, right? But it, so it's kind of like what needs to happen to the food system by the year 2050 with, you know, all these factors going into play. So this kind of prompt was sent out, it was sponsored through the Rockefeller Foundation. And uh, basically 10 finalists were chosen uh, from seven different countries um, that all had a very unique sort of idea of what needed to happen within their own ecosystem, within their region, to create a better system. And this is, and when you say a food system, it's it's not literally just the food itself, it's actually the production of food, the manufacturing, the delivery, the consumption, it's the whole entire system, right? End to end. End to end. So uh, now before this, I had literally, I've looked like a fair to say a bad relationship with food. I mean, food to me was purely fuel. And like, I would even wear it as a point of pride sometimes. It's like, yeah, I eat when I have to, but I just like want to work or whatever. You know what I mean? It was very food. I never had, I wasn't born with that kind of like thing where food made me feel good to go eat food or something like that. You know, it wasn't sort of like this, oh, I can't wait to go sit and have a meal with a friend. Food was kind of like, sure, I guess I got to do it, you know? So I, I was the opposite of somebody interested in this. Um, but the project, again, like it came to me in a, in a way. It was a phone call and I was asked to do it from somebody who I'd known for many years, um, who had the job basically as the producer on the project and wanted me to direct it. I had just come off of directing a global documentary about UFOs for the last two years uh, through the History Channel called Unidentified. And so I knew kind of how to go uh, uh, into a place uh, with a small group of people, very surgically, very much like special ops, go in, tell the story, come out. And that's kind of what was needed on this project because you had to be kind of light on your feet. And so, um, you know, I said yes. And and it ended up being just like, I was really happy I had the relationship I had prior because I think it enabled me to look at things through a lens that I think a lot of people look at when they look at food, which is not the foodies of the world and not the people that already know there's a problem. They don't need to see this documentary. They're already doing the good stuff. They're already being sustainable. They're already eating organic. Like the people that know the problems and know what the meaning of good food is, don't need to see this. The people needing to see this are people like me that didn't know. And so I constantly felt like I was trying to build a bridge from these brilliant people telling me these things to what is a normal mainstream everyday audience person that is just, you know, looks at organic food and says that costs more money than non-organic, like end of sentence, you know, what is, 
how to how to reach speak to that. So these seven finalists, we ended up going to uh, Peru, Lima, Peru, um, the Netherlands, uh, Amsterdam. We went to Nigeria. We went to Nairobi, Kenya. We went to uh, India, three different places within India. Uh, and then I had a remote crew up to Canada and a remote crew out at China. And then we did two places here in the United States, South Dakota and New York. And this was, we started shooting last April and we finished in November. So it was within seven, seven, eight months, seven months. We did, did a lot of traveling. Wow. During COVID. Okay. Can I aggressively bridge real quick? Please. So, um, as you said that, I think, um, uh, I got I got to do an aggressive sidebar here, but it's part of it. So January 2021 for me, I was in Denver, Colorado, with that art collective, and their part of what they were doing was guided psilocybin ceremonies. And um, my role at that moment wasn't as a primary facilitator, but they knew that I had some experience, so they were like, "Can you assist us in holding space?" I did an opening prayer. It was a vibe. And then it's pretty much hands off because I'm not one of the main facilitators to like, et cetera. But one thing happened in January, 2021 that I swear to you stayed with me more than any other theme throughout that year, which was, let's just, as of right now, put it in quotation marks called the in-between, which another, I would say synonym for that is the bridge. Mm. And there was this moment where a group was walking in. This comes right back to your everything you just said. I'm not aggressively bridging away for no reason. Um, there was a moment where a group was like, yo, let's step out back real quick and, and grab a smoke and just clear our heads. And I'm walking with them and the rest of the people are behind us. And I'm walking through this you know, hallway and then they go through this door and then uh, it's a room and then there's a door. So there's a doorway and then there's the room and then there's the door that goes outside. And as I'm walking through the doorway, my guidance system, you could call it my guides, but I just caught my guidance says, stop. And I stop and it says, put your forehead on the, the doorway. So like, this is the doorway. I put my head and nose up against it. And this is with a, not too much, but a, a couple of grams of psilocybin in me. And I put my bridge of my nose and my forehead on the bridge of that door. So my left eye seeing in this room, my right eye seeing down this hallway and spirit is telling me, stay in between. If you're in neither space, you can watch both spaces. And it was profound in the moment and I knew exactly what it was, but I swear to you that probably as a moment was my primary thread of the fabric of 2021 and my guidance, which was to, it was like, people say, you gotta commit to something. Uh, you can't do uh, four one foot in one foot out, man. And I swear it was like some kind of higher is like, trust this shit, trust this shit. And I put one foot in and I'd keep one foot out. And then it turned into this Kriya thing for these other yogic situations that were happening where I'd guide people as to put your awareness one foot into the body and then one foot out. Stay into this room, but also don't overly identify as the person in the conversation and observe from a place beyond or prior to the person. And so that was my context of, of, of the, the aggressive uh, segue sidebar before saying this, which is a direct reflection of what you're saying, which now gets more to what you were just saying about food specifically. Mm. And what you just said, you said that it is something, something, something bridge. And right before you had said the word bridge, I heard the word bridge in my head. Cause I was like, ah, oh, it sounds like, it sounds like he might've got shown what I was showing. And it's like, uh, cause, cause, cause we're like video game co co-conspirers and on the levels of life we go to, we know this. Yes, yes. Which sidebar, Ready Player One, I've been, Spirit has shown me aggressively. I have a full script and a deck for Robert Rodriguez that I need your lens on. That's just like a critique. Send it. Um, ultra sidebar. Um, being a bridge as, an, as a term, as this like evolution of earth, as the evolution of humanity, as this evolution of things that are happening, got introduced, I say in 2019, because it's like some things, are deep esoteric mystery type shit that are not for everybody. They're for the they're for the deep aspirant or the adept, you know, the seeker that's really interested in that shit. Most people aren't interested in that shit. Um, so what is something that not only is not to the extreme ultra 
but what's something that gets into more so the natural general body and it's like a bridge content bridge content is something that's not it's not too muggle you know it it's not too esoteric it's literally a bridge from i have no idea about any of this stuff to hmm i'm interested now in learning more and it sounds like that's what you're talking about with the kind of uh the bridge of this piece of of moving away from maybe uh, correct me if otherwise but it sounds like kind of unconscious food consumption identities yep. into call it maybe conscious. beginner to intermediate conscious food consuming sure. um, yes so in that what do you feel you know and and if for those listening and for those two participating and speaking this was like the intro of matthew's lensing and then a rocco lens to now talking about like a quantum tectonic plate that's shifting in the collective about being more conscious about what we put in our bodies and our relationship to the body as a thing that eats it was like i'm hungry it was like mm, my body's hungry and this kind of stepping back that creates more space which in that spaciousness because of the non uh you know smushed up against the identification of the thing of the thing there's some space to recognize the space in which the 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 impulse is coming from so um i love the way you use words hey blessings man I, it takes one to know one. um yeah really can't uh, uh appreciate you enough for allowing the space that you that you allow which hey let's put this in a sidebar let's let's hit this food topic real quick and then Okay. come back to that because you create space that's kind of one of the main things you do you you know on a set what's what oh, is yeah. it what are you doing you're freaking it's saying dinner party you're just you're, hosting a dinner party right and in that certain conversations are quote unquote allowed or rather encouraged and supported and others are almost you know, i'm interested in you if you've ever had to like take somebody aside and be like yeah um, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're here as a team and whatever that was, you and Courtney tonight, you know, what's going on. Yeah. That's kind of not helping. And yeah. we needed to, we needed to stop. We need that to not happen as we yeah, do. Yeah. Um, right. which that's a great mirror seg segue bar. These yeah. are a lot of ping pongs happening. It's great, but that's a great conversation that basically is happening in people's minds. Hey, yeah. Hey, um, you know, this thing that you're doing with your food, it's not really actually helping anymore. Knock that shit off. Right. Um, so I guess the baton that I'll pass you is like, what is, do you feel like the main takeaway from, it's a multi-layered question, I guess, slash, I don't even think it's a question because it's a, really just a baton, but what is that main takeaway that you took from that project and this, this realization or deepening in your awareness of what food is, but also what's the collective needing in your, in your newly deepened lens in terms of a relationship with food? And, and whether that's carnivorous or it's vegetarianist or veganist or yeah. whatever is, um, what is, what is the bridge that you feel like is the most in, in the land of McDonald's and Whole Foods, the full spectrum in between air one, air one to McDonald's. I, I think that covers the spectrum. What do you feel like is the bridge that we as a collective are not just needing to walk across, but already walking across into our evolved relationship with food on earth yeah 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 it's a great question um it's a great question honestly still after this whole endeavor i feel you know only qualified to speak towards my own what i have noticed has actually changed my experience of living because i think everything else is just you know What's actually changed me is before I sit in front of a meal, I'm thanking every bit of food on my plate. I'm, th I'm thinking about where it came from and I'm thanking it. I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful for the hands that made it, for the land that gave it, the animals that it came from. Like I'm thankful for its process. And I think I don't see a product anymore. I see a process. Um, and in seeing that process, and I really do, I mean, every time I get food, I can't not think about it now because I've just been hearing it for a year, you know, so now that I'm always, it's just in front of me. And I think, you know, regardless of the technology we come up with and the money we throw at an issue, like there are going to have to be people, human beings, farmers are the ones doing the work, feeding all of us. We thank our veterans for their service. 
We thank the people that keep us protected. Farmers, these people actually cultivating this food, that's like the most basic thing we need. It's like the number one highest rate of suicide profession in the United States right now. I gotta double check that if it's still recent, but like last hour of research, farmers, highest rate of suicide profession. In America or Earth? In America. I gotta double check that stat though. Put an asterisk there. But the last time I was doing my research, that was one of the things that like stuck out at me big time. And you could just see it around the world. Like people are not, young people aren't going to want to be farmers. They're trying to not do that. You know what I'm saying? So like the, the very, so it's a human thing, right? Get concepts aside, veganism, all these things, the isms, put that aside. The human issue is there are people making our food for us and it's a very difficult profession and I would say most people I know are very removed from that appreciation value that it's coming from somebody and that it's a very difficult job and it's only getting harder and, and their wages and profit margins are getting smaller and things are changing in a way uh, such as culture and all kinds of things with environment that are just making that job even harder. So that was number one. I met a lot of farmers and they're just the most amazing people. They're grounded, they're real. They, they understand that beautiful balance of life between you have to be assertive towards nature, you have to have will, you have to be solar, you have to work hard, and you got to be like, I didn't plan this rain, but fuck, got rain today, you know what I mean? And you got to receive and be willing to receive and receive these changes. So they're human beings that just their natural rhythm of living is an understanding of that ebb and flow, which I just think there's so much to learn from that group of people. I, I hear you pointing at the kind of grounded, uh, integral, practical spirituality of earth stewardship. Yeah, exact, earth stewardship, brilliant, beautiful. And like, look, you could be talking about people, like there's, you know, we're talking about technology that can help make these professions maybe easier, all these things, like people, somebody has to operate that. There's somebody's knowledge, there's something at the end of the day, there's a human being there. So I think I just became really cognizant of the human beings. And then on, on every step of the way of the production process, like all the way to the consumer. Okay, so there's that. That's I'll just call that like awareness level one. Grateful for that. Awareness level two is there is no blanket statement or solution from what I can tell that is going to solve all of it. We are a complicated, big, beautiful universe or planet yes, universe, planet. And in this planet, these different countries all cope with very unique issues. And sometimes one place, one country, or even just one community, their, what their solution needs to be might be the problem to another community. You, so, you have an example of that? Because that's a profound idea. For example, there might be a certain community in the Netherlands where their major concern is, you know, consumers being able to uh, choose the right option that's going to be the healthiest for them. It's going to be the um, the most conducive to, uh, to animal uh, well-being, and it's going to treat the land in a way that is uh, the least uh, obtrusive to the soil and to the health, right? So they're kind of focused on, because in the Netherlands, like, things are pretty great, you know, like, just being there, like, there's farms everywhere, like, they're very, like, I mean, everywhere's got their problems, but, like, they've they're really focused on sort of, I'll call it like if there was a hierarchy of needs, like they're very focused in a way of like, how can we make this whole system more circular, more better for everybody? We're I really feel like that's a European, like a Finland, Sweden, Netherlands. They're kind of, they're as Laszlo's hierarchy, they kind of got at the bottom shit figured out. They're up here now. At least in comparison to what I saw of other places in the world. Yeah. It, it felt like, you know, other places, in the world, for example, communities in San Juan de Miraflores in Lima, Peru they're trying to get water, like they need water because they don't have enough access to water in these communities and they can't even start to begin to talk about agriculture or creating rooftop gardens or being prosumers or being some kind of like, you know, advocate for their own gardening and health until they have water. So like, you know, and it's not to say one, like that doesn't, they don't, they're not at odds at each other. But what I'm trying to say is like, there's just very different things that need to happen in these different places. Um, some people are very focused on the consumption side, some people on the producing side. Farmers need to make better profits, but also the consumers need to have better access to it. So if the consumers need to have better access to it, it's got to be cheaper. But wait, if it's cheaper, then the farmers don't make enough money. So like there's these things that you you put, you change something here, it affects here. So uh, 
all that to say, I didn't just go through this thinking, oh, wow, this is just really complex and unsolvable. I just realized, okay, these solutions, you just got to look at your own backyard. You just got to look at your own life, your own, like your own consumer choices, your own communities. Um, ecosystem and what's important there, your local farmers that are trying to create, like support your local farmers, su support the local system, because that is where you're going to be able to have the most impact. And if everybody supports their local system, you're going to have a global system that feels a little more healed. Okay, so that's number two. Then number three of, uh, of the awareness change, um, it, it, it came from the fact that you know, food and what we put into our bodies affects just about everything. Um, and what we are doing, agriculture is a naturally destructive process. Like agriculture by its necessity is we are disrupting nature. You know, we are um, manipulating it in a way that is not natural, but okay, we've, we're far beyond that. We're at the point we got to do that to function as a planet, right? So we're here. The way in which we treat the soil and the way in which we try to focus on the root of a problem, not on the way something looks, not on saying like, I'm going to take more supplements because I need X amount more in my body. I'm not saying anything's wrong with supplements, but I'm saying instead of just looking at solutions, the root of things is soil has to be healthier to be at its root, the thing that makes everything that comes from it healthier, every plant that comes from it, and then from the plant, the fruit, and from the fruit, the thing that eats the fruit. So I learned this thing, basically, that you are what you eat, eats. My grandma used to always say, you are what you eat. Grew up learning that. But I kind of took it a step further with this, which is you are what you eat, eats. And you think about the cow that you eat, if you're a carnivore, or you just, you know, you eat everything, that cow, is it eating grains because it's stuck in a tiny little cage and it's being fed grains, even though cows are supposed to be grazing grass? So is the cow ingesting something that then is making it stressed out? And then that stress of that cow, you are then ingesting the stress of that cow. So now you are stressed and now everybody's stressed in the world because we're eating stressed animals. You know, so it's like, it's, it's going back one step further to the thing that is, what is our food consuming? What are our plants consuming? What's the, the health of that soil? And, and that comes back to practices that creates, to bring it all back to creating awareness and building a bridge is even farmers have to be incentivized to use more of these practices that create healthier soil, that create healthier production. And they're only gonna be incentivized to do that if at the consumer end, there's a demand for it. And if they can do it cheaply, because honestly, their shit's already hard, you know? And like, they probably, most farmers, I think in India, at least this was the case when we interviewed people in Delhi and people in Varda and people in uh, Araku Valley, they were all very willing and accepting and excited to change from chemical agriculture to sustainable organic agriculture when they were taught it. And when they knew there was gonna be a market and they could make a profit off of it. But if there was no market and no profit, yeah, they look at how you know good it is, but you're not going to be able to convince anybody to abandon supporting their family for something that doesn't have a problem. So, you know, I, I don't know if maybe I'm getting too in the weeds. Haha, uh, I intended. It's, with, it's, it's good because especially with things like Monsanto, you know, uh, suing people for planting uh, seeds that don't have their patents. I don't know if you're familiar with that, uh, but like uh, there, there's an incredible level of abuse of these major conglomerates, I mean, obviously it's specifically in Monsanto, that like have a monopoly on genetically modified, um, you know, uh, it's it's not real seeds, but it's seeds. And then they, they because they have the money, they pay all these farmers, you'll plant these seeds only. But then that creates this entire culture of people who have never really actually had food that's just from uninterrupted organic from earth to us. It's It's had somebody, some humans, hand in the way of it mm. so what you hear, i hear you talking about this kind of destimulating of these uh money incentivized processes and destimulating those processes with health incentivized processes or organic which i would say that the purpose of organic is health it's and other and other much smarter people than me have come up with these solutions already right i'm i'm trying to find the ones that I think are the easiest to articulate in a certain amount of time to capture somebody that otherwise wouldn't give a shit 
to give a shit. Because right? you're a storyteller and that could be, your, your documentary might be as much study as anybody's ever done on it. My, you know, like I can't, you know, and I'm almost happy that I haven't done a deep dive for 10 years about this stuff, because what I might find interesting at the end of those 10 years might be really hard to now communicate back to somebody who you've got four seconds with them selecting what they want to watch to interest, right? However, I also realize one documentary, one anything is not going to do, even if it's the most emotionally compelling thing in the world, I've seen some amazing documentaries and I've like called up friends and been like, yo, this is amazing. Check it out. And maybe for like three days, I'll change the way I do something. And then I'll go right back to how I was. So I also don't, I don't want to sit here and think that I can make one film or anyone can make one film that on its own will all of a sudden spark tremendous change. But I do think that like you said, Rocco, you can build a bridge so that all it takes is one person to have one level further in awareness so that they're stepping towards this place of growth in their own consciousness, of growth in the way that they look at the world with just a little bit of a wider glimpse. Maybe it will give them the impetus to just choose that one other thing at the grocery store that they wouldn't have even thought about otherwise. Like, I, I think that is very real. And I think that's where storytelling can slowly change the hearts of people, right? But then it takes actual experience of life to change life, right? And, and they do go, go hand in hand. But, but I'll just say like, you know, since I started working on this project, see this is my, one of my plants here. Nice. When I started working on it, this plant, it was just like right here. And then it just started growing. And look, it's been growing towards me, this entire thing. It's literally, it's not growing towards the light. It's been growing towards me. It's just the most beautiful thing. I swear to God, Rocco, plants, like they just, you know, everything has a spirit. Everything has a, uh, everything has a soul. Every, everything, like when it works right, it works in harmony. I learned that from Jack Algier in, in Stone Barns in Hudson Valley, New York. He's one of the most famous organic farmers, like considered to some people, like, you know, one of the the OG organic farmers. Um, and he said that, you know, in an intact food system, uh, everything actually is supposed to work perfectly well together. Nothing gives more than it takes, right? It all wins. And so we live in a way that somehow, like not everybody always wins. There's like a, there's a winner and a loser in a lot of senses. There's an economic win or a loss. There's you know, the winner of the negotiation, the loser, and like, but like when nature's left to function on its own, like, and everything does its thing, right? It's like perfect. It's like really not, you know, and it's, it's really beautiful. And so anyway, that's just, uh, that was the last thing I learned is that my plants like to grow towards me when, when, uh, when I'm shining bright, I guess. Amazing. Uh, yeah, they'll always glow, go and grow to what glows as the light. Um, because if you were maybe reflecting a different unconscious energy that was like disrespectful or dissonant to them, then they probably, maybe they'd grow away from you if you weren't benefiting their growth and stimulation in a positive way. Um, I think that's a perfect segue to um, the gardening of non-food, food sources. Mm. Because you're talking about, let's let's just overlay a couple dimensions on top of each other because they really are the same let's talk about being on set let's talk yeah. about the curation of our most close proximity social relationships call it friend or family groups um within that our family is technically what we're born into as a, as a karmic situation it's it's you know it's technically our, our first most immediate karma other than our body itself we have physical pain how we deal with that pain is you could say that that's gardening the stress or gardening etc energy source etc but in terms of making everything integral because to me that's what christ consciousness is all about uh jim moon has said it is it's been saying this lately is like jesus is functional hungry people food food hungry people make it happen as soon as we get up in our head about it and it becomes like socially hierarchical and and political for the means of a gaining power that's only relevant in popularity it's it's fucked it's stupid it's not it's it's ridiculous it doesn't make sense and someone is going to lose the out or lose that's in this win lose situation you point out it's um i would say that that is a 
tectonic plate of the old world, of the old system, of the old way of doing things, which is, you know, diametrically opposed forces, which is uh, black and white, this or that, which is duality, the emphasis of duality. Duality exists as much as we're ever going to be in a body and there's going to be the thing that's outside of our body. But the more and more that we can get, this to me is what crystallinity is all about. I think the word Christ and Christ consciousness and spirituality are some of the most most and ego are some of the most misunderstood terms accessible to humanity and it's yeah. as you know it's part of my calling to simplify yeah. and simplicity river water just flows um then there's those uh i'm thinking of a scenario i'm sure you can visualize and many also can coming up in the 90s those like you know, the, the pinball drops and then it rolls and then it clicks over this thing and then it goes and then the thing spins and then it drops down and then it tips the hourglass and the hourglass are dripping and then boom, and then a drop of water. Comes. I just learned this today. Like four hours ago, I was working on a project where I was introduced this thing, a Ruth Ginsburg machine or a room, Ruth, Ruth, shoot, someone watching this is going to think of it. There's like a, oh God, I just learned the name of it. It's like, sounds like somebody's name. Um, it's Ruth Ginsburg. You know what I'm talking about? It's like the Ruth little Ginsburg. Game. Isn't she like not, a, a not Ruth Ginsburg? Damn it! It's like Rube Goldberg. She, Rube. Nope. Nope. That's an author. Ruth no, it is. Oh. Rube. Look up Rube Goldberg. Rube Goldberg. Rube Goldberg, and the machine. The Rube Goldberg machine. The Rube Goldberg machine, named after American cartoonist Rube Goldberg, is a chain reaction type machine or contraption intentionally designed to perform a simple task in an indirect and overcomplicated way. Right? Yeah, this is the image that popped up right here. That's it. That's what you're talking about, right? The little like... Yeah, it's like a, a scenario that is just like, dear God, the thing could have just dripped simply, but you had to make this incredibly indirect, complicated pathway for it. But there's something in its intricacy yep. it's it's kind of almost entertaining yeah we, we've all seen these kind of situations where it's just like this goes in yeah. ding, 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 ding. Yeah. and it feels like there's a lot of that in society yeah and i would say that that's in society because it's in the mental psychological structures of people who have created society who have been right. who have had a key hand in that um and it's not functional it's uh it's functional in a realm that has become less and less, uh, follow me here, I'm going someplace. Um, it's become less and less functional because at some point socialness was the evolution. We went from, let's just call it, we went from um, hunter-gatherer cave to more and more ev uh, evolved, which meant less scattered and more together which means we were traveling less as hunter-gatherers. We started planting food. We stopped traveling all the time. We stayed somewhere and we developed the land. We curated the land. We grew with the land. Yeah. Then all of a sudden, everybody's together all the time. Your tribe isn't just you. It's you and then 15 other tribes. So now y'all are one big tribe. But in that, now there is an awareness of everyone's relevance towards the growth, expansion, and positive uh positive stimulation of the group so something like social ranking becomes extremely relevant in terms of who gets responsibility who is supposed to do that and who's not supposed to do that where does all that information live in our psyche in our mind so then you fast forward and i just i just see this period of anthropology this period of social growth of like you know european um uh, and, and I guess it's just not, it's not only European, but I, I specifically reference European of like, you know, uh, kings and queens and like, not just medieval, but like, uh, but, but I suppose in that time, there's probably a better term for it, but like, you know, people wearing these like really, um, the word for it is like, uh, you know, fluffy dresses, they're fluffy hairs and they're, they're, they're now really getting, um, decorative in their physical appearance it's like what function does that have well it's meant to articulate the level and degree of evolved um not socialness uh uh aesthetic so aesthetic, that it yeah but there's, a, there's a word of like um your your intellectual evolvedness and also i think it's connected to cleanliness i think the whole conversation with uh-huh 
black and white and melanin and social hierarchy actually is, is somehow it gets close really on a quantum level to cleanliness and cleanliness is ability to be away from dirt and dirt as a resemblance of Gaia, Gaia is dirt, but if a person's dirty, then they haven't cleaned themselves. But if you're really, really clean, then you haven't been that close to dirt, which means you're able to afford some level of being away from dirt, but you still got to live. So it means you're in some way financially able to or powerful enough to still sustain your life while not being connected to the thing that actually makes you dirty, which is earth. So it's like this more and more we got evolved, we actually get less integrated and more into our heads and that's what happened and now i see the age of aquarius as and i'm not alone in seeing that this is the second coming this is the this is the the evolution moment the end of this piscean age this end of this yuga um and it's like all right shit's got to really be functional christ can't just be a a superhero character that we look to when we're fucked up it's got to be integral and we should be a resemblance of it. To me, that's what Yeshua's teaching has been to me. It's like, you know, don't just look to me to do your shit for you. Like get up off the couch and, you know, wear that same cape that I wore. Do that, do that same vibe. I'm a mirror. This is what a mirror really does. It's like, it helps you see yourself. And so a mirror of, I don't know where I'm going here, but a mirror of the evolution of apes, boom, Jane Goodall, the evolution of, um, whatever, politics, someone comes in and they're a revolutionary. Boom, the evolution of farming and agricultural systems. I'm sure that there's been people that have been really notable in evolving things forward. Same thing with trauma and dealing with the nervous system, regulating your ability to deal with emotions and karma at, at, the, at the degree of psychological, you know, uh, when someone's crazy, it means that it's not working. It means that your psyche is not functional it's dysfunctional and it's preventing you from living life and uh you need to get something figured out there so i say all those things and they stack on top of each other that happens in our environment with food and to me this is where my you know my literal spiritual awakening quote unquote call it happened with my body's food diet bullshit I didn't, I was not conscious of what I was putting into my food. And I was like, oh, I'm young and I'm healthy. I can eat cereal for dinner, you know, Captain Crunch, eh, like a couple of times a week, but I'll be okay. Um, I know I get a stomach ache when I eat this, but you know, I'll be okay. And I was disregarding, I was dysfunctional. I wasn't making sense. And then it hit this point, 2014, I got Epstein-Barr, mononucleosis, you know, my, my adrenal glands and my pituitary gland clashed, crashed. That's when I found psilocybin. That's when I found ayahuasca. That's when I found this documentary on the internet called DMT Spirit Molecule, F Forks Over Knives, um, What the Bleep Do We Know, um, uh, uh, Something Up, F Food, Food Inc. Food mm -hmm. Inc. was a big one. Um, mm -hmm. Several hugely potent documentaries about food really got my brain working because I saw my physical body was not functioning properly. Yeah. Um, so I'm still stacking it, but it's like our ethos as a culture in all cultures, but then our global culture, our relationship to food personally, but then culturally and then subculturally, our political situation, our relationship to gender right now, really percolating and oscillating more quickly than ever before. And there's a level of transparency to it because the age of the internet has kind of broken through this level of hiding behind um, the character of the self. I think that's also part of this thing that kind of coming to a close of like putting on a show as being a person. People are interested in being real. People are interested more than ever, I think, of being like, show me what's really going on. Show me who you really are. So creating a culture. I love that term because it's like in science class, you know, you want to create an experiment and look at what's going on in this molecular bacterial situation. You create a culture for it. It means a closed encapsulated container where you can observe something's growth and evolution and how mm -hmm. they interplay with each other. And mm -hmm. so you're on a set, you're telling people this, you're telling people that the way that you use your language, it affects how consciousness moves, whether they're holding the camera, whether they're the ones saying the lines, you're very much curating a space. Mm -hmm. When you're telling me about this situation with food, it's like, okay, the body is the first space. Mm -hmm. We often think, no, I'm, a, I'm the body and I'm in a space. It was like, 
No, you're observing the space of the body. You have a crank on the left side, or you have a knot on the right. Da, da, da. It's like the body is its own space. But then the space where we get the body from is our food. And we more and more develop that. Um, I guess some kind of macro, micro baton to pass you about like, you know, there's a there's an overall awakening happening that happens vertically and horizontally in in all of these systems. And people are, I think, in all of these different sectors, and I don't participate in like agricultural or, or really know many farmers, but um, I know there's a spectrum of consciousness that's happening right now. People are more and less conscious about everything. There's performers, there's directors, there's storytellers, there's farmers, there's porn stars, there's mechanics, and there's a spectrum of consciousness in that. How in tune with the process, as you said, not just the product, but the process, are they? And I think this might be the, the bow tie for it. The way in which we're conducting ourselves, which let's call it the how. The how is, yeah, this, this is the baton. Maybe speak on something that you've noticed in the way that you conduct yourself as a quantum electromagnetic effulgence you're a signal you know the way that you carry yourself is affects the way that your crew the way that the people on set behave what are we what are we seeing right now i guess i guess it's still not a question i want i'm looking for a question to ask you but it's just a bunch of statements um in the form of a large question um it's like this is happening on all these different platforms of you know people are getting canceled people are getting fired because their how wasn't integral with the space why is what is why is anybody canceled well you're disconnected because the way that you're saying that is like that is not indicative of where we're wanting to go so you kind of can't come with this anymore you know mm -hmm. why wouldn't a food system why wouldn't an agricultural practice come with us into 50 years from now mm -hmm. probably because it's not fucking working mm -hmm. why would mcdonald's not still be blasting out with this mind-numbing idea that it doesn't matter what's in our food just enjoy that it's cheap why wouldn't that work anymore people are evolving into their sensitivity of the space and the spaces from which they get their stuff mm. they're evolving into the sensitivity of awareness of what they consume and the spaces that they get what they consume from what do you notice in that? There's the question. So what I just noticed is the gift of you just painting that whole narrative and arriving where you just arrived, that is what I try to give to people when I'm filming. It's exactly what you just felt. If you felt permission to find a thought and follow it to its completion, then I did my job right. That's what I try to do when I make a dog. It's like I just provide the space so that people can be a free flowing of their own, whatever you want to call it, you know? Um, it's the same thing on a set. I think this is where I'm gonna go here and then I'm gonna go, oh, there's a couple, I'm gonna respond to you in, in a similar fashion, but, um, yeah, it's it's the actually the not so much it's the hmm, some of it you can't talk about because then you just ruin the magic of it, you know, like but I'm so curious as to what you can't talk about because it would ruin magic, but maybe you can't tell me. Because like, it no, because it would ruin it for me. Like I don't want it to get here because it's so great. It feels so good here. Oh, when it goes here, I just it ruins it. Well, this is where po this is where poetry comes in because you can point at stuff without being too blatant about it. This though. is why I make movies so you can go watch them. So I don't have to, you know, because it just it's there. The whole thing is there. But, but I think what I mean is like the, the um, yeah, it's the space in between of what you say that actually is what you do as a film director. I think it's what I do. I don't think it's so much of what I actually say. What I say is very important at the times when I say it. But, um, you know, it's if people feel like they're in their best position to be freely creative and if they feel 
supported to make their own creative risks. I genuinely believe my job there is the same as like a shepherd. I'm just like protecting the flock. I'm making sure nothing bad happens to them. And I'm making sure they get to where they need to go. But I'm not, I'm not the one like producing all the wool. I'm not, I'm not doing like, I have to let all of them shine and be fluffy and be wonderful. And I just got to protect them from the wolves. And I just got to bring them home. You know, like, I, I think that like when I'm out shooting the docks, at least like, I got to make sure that I can tune in my two cameramen, my DP and my op into their most compassionate framing of how they see the world. Because if they are looking that day through compassion, through curiosity, whatever the day requires, sometimes it's passion, curiosity. Sometimes you got to look at the world through like scrutiny. So it's different. But if I can tune them into that, then they're going to film it on their camera because they're already good at what they do. You know what I mean? Like I don't hire people that aren't good at what they do. So like they already know how to work a camera really well, but for them to know where to point it exactly is that they feel the same level of observation and curiosity as I feel tuned into where I'm trying to do them. I, I don't, I cannot every moment say, put the camera exactly right there and film that leaf so that it looks that like that in the lens. I, you know, on cinema, when I'm doing like a film and we're going shot by shot through a shot list every day, very different. When I'm yeah, doing a documentary- you might, you might have a storyboard and you're like, no, we need the shape of the leaf on the tree. Like yeah. this. And that's for a reason, right? There's a poetry in that that I can't always explain, but I know I need that because I'm putting together a specific mosaic. But when I'm doing a documentary, what I really like about it is that it really, you are an adventurer, you are an expert, you are going to absorb, witness, perceive what's around you. And then I just, I have to be like doing improv. Like I do, I did improv growing up and like, I love improvisation and you kind of improv direct, like you show up, you know what eventually what you want to get to, but I'm in the moment saying, all right, um, yeah, grab him doing that right here. Just let him take five steps and then pick up the camera and get a little tighter when he actually puts it down into the pot. Okay, you okay, you guys start dancing with each other. And it gets to the point where I just look at them and I go, and then I'll go walk over and talk to the interview subject, getting them ready for the interview while they're capturing this process that can't be replicated. So they got to go do that. And I got to go over here. Like it's uh -huh. this beautiful dance. All right, let me, let me um, zoom in because that's, to me, that's it. If you were disconnected, from what would be best you wouldn't be receptive and would ref and wouldn't be reflective mm. how, how important ha have you found it to be reflective in this process of yeah you got your idea but it can't be at the price of discluding i don't think that's a word di uh you, you can't overemphasize your vision at the price of, you can keep your vision, you can allow your vision to exist, but you can't keep your vision at the price of discounting the relevance of the environment's reflection on you in face of your vision, no? It's like a New Year's resolution. I got some things that I'm like, I want this to happen. And I got other things where I'm like, I just got to kind of take stock of what's right in front of me right here. And that's doc. It's the same thing how you started the conversation. Like it's, the, I try to do the same thing. It's like, I, you gotta just take stock of what's right in front of you that you could never plan in a million years. This, you know, a, a beautiful moment where like this, you know, for example, we were, we were in, um, we were in Nairobi and we were at the dump sites and we were witnessing, um, you know, people that actually go and scavenge for food at the dump sites every day. And these are, you know, three, four stories high, just trash combusting randomly because of the certain chemicals in the trash that literally will catch fire throughout the day. Like just the most, um, wow. It, yeah, it was it crazy. And, and that day there was just these, these two schoolgirls that were in their school uniforms walking home from school and their route was to walk straight through the dump site. And they're just like maybe five years old, seven years old, and they're just holding each other's hands, two sisters walking through it. And you just, the, you know, it's like the moments like that where you just, I didn't even need a, you know, you didn't even need a camera. Like we didn't want to, you know, show their faces. So we, it wasn't even about the shot. It was about feeling what that moment was of like, wow, you know, and they're talking about, what happened at school? 
and they're just walking through this like dump, literally a dump and trying not to get their like probably one school uniform like dirty. And, you know, I don't know, it just said everything in like the poetry. And so that was something that like life is happening regardless of, you know, you or not sometimes. And, and you just have to be ready to capture it. Sometimes it's a gift. Sometimes you have to feel like, wow, that was manna from heaven. Thank you. Other times you're like, this was pure serendipity and man, I'm a lucky person. And other times it's just like, just keep your eyes open and actually you're going to witness things like that happening every day, which is just poetry in motion, which is just meaning of life in motion, which is juxtaposition in present moment like and that's what makes good movies is you see the competing forces of nature two innocent schoolgirls walking through a place where people are scavenging for food because they have no other options and like you know what i'm saying like you just you find these things and you only find them when you're when you're completely present and but at the same token i went in there with a very specific purpose we have a couple days in this location and we have to cover this story because I know the story I know what they're trying to say so it's like I gotta make sure I cover these buckets and I can't leave without doing it because there's no way I'm going to be able to come back to Nairobi you know but at the same time like it's like how do you do that and then how do you become ready to receive and then so and I think why I like directing and why I like the documentary approach is because it just it's just like having a conversation in life like I'm at like to have a good conversation with you Rocco I'm going to do listening and I'm going to do talking and I got to listen sometimes. And I got to talk sometimes. When you make a movie like a doc, you got to listen a lot. And then you got to take your time to talk. And you got to say, now, this is what I have to say about this. And I got to look at a scene. And sometimes my guys, it's the opposite. Sometimes they're like, Matt, we want to shoot all this stuff, right? And I'm like, don't need it. Can't. Not important. I'm sorry. That is so cool for something else in another timeline, but not right now. You know, and, and you have to know when to say no to things, too. So... Uh, I don't know if that all like points to something specific, but it, it is the process and, and I like it because it informs me as a man about life. And then when I go come home here and I write my stories and I write things from my imagination, oh, they're so much richer now because they're like coming from what I've just absorbed from what's, you know, been my source material, which is through a UFO documentary and a documentary about the soil from space to soil there's a lot in between there that now I really want to go say in my way. Um, and I wouldn't be able to do that if I didn't have these experiences of witnessing. Uh, and you don't have to go on a documentary to go witness life with the kind of scrutiny you do as a documentarian. You can do that every day if you choose to. You have Everyone's got an iPhone. Everyone can go treat their life every day like I'm going to be a documentarian about it. And I promise you, if you go with that attitude, the amount you just start perceiving and recognizing and it's really yeah it's really powerful i see a macro micro in and, it, and i think it coalesced when you said something something like you, this is where you take it into where how you, how you show up as a man yeah where it's like um and and quick quick acknowledgement of the framework that i'm processing with for this medium as a as a you know, we're personally talking and then we're both aware that people will listen to us talking, mm -hmm. quote yeah. unquote, podcast, cast, yes. but also the cast, right? pod, encapsulated cast. Interesting. Um, it's not like I'm mining value or I'm looking for value, but that I start to see the value and then I start to see the macro micro application of maybe your subjective lensing or an experience that's very particular and personal to you that's super um, applicable to how, how my system feels. It is like, ooh, that's a good mirror. And so you said, uh, da, 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 take it as and how I live as a man, something like that. And it's like, to me, that's you as a functional person, which let's let's be clear. If you are a whack filmmaker, and a shitty person, you probably wouldn't be getting these jobs, right or wrong. I, I just realized what I was going to, it was about the functional thing. I was going to try to wait for my way back to that. Anyway, do continue it. your thought. No, no, okay. do it if you got it. Well, I just was having this conversation with a friend yesterday. It's crazy how relevant it seems oh. like our conversations always are. It's ridiculous. Um, I was having a conversation with a friend over the phone, and we were talking about, you know, spiritual stuff. And, and, and he was reminding me that Jesus Christ was a, was known to like tell jokes and parables and like 
Buddha supposedly was funny and all these spiritual leaders were had a way to communicate through humor because they had to communicate to the level that we live on and it's functional and you make someone laugh it's way easier to then drive home this fundamental truth about existence right like all the you know i mean even huge philosophers of our time i mean the astronomers the cause like all kinds of people that try to communicate big ideas the most successful ones have amazing senses of humor and I think that speaks to what you're saying, which is this functionality where like you, you, yeah, you, maybe you need to be at this level to like let these kind of big ideas come down. But what you speak it through, be, you know, either gotta be funny or interesting, or it's kind of communicated some level where, you know, you'll, you'll bring in a functional audience that is, takes value. And then you sneak in the medicine. I think I've had this, I've had this sort of conversation with you about like, I, I always, I love the idea of like gummy vitamins. I used to eat them all the time as a kid, even when I didn't need them, like I'd eat like eight of them because they tasted good. But then I'm like, got 10,000% vitamin C because of that. But it's like, I'm eating them because they're gummies right. and they snuck in the vitamins. They snuck in the medicine. Right. And I think sometimes people need to think they're eating a gummy. And that kind of circles back to the sort of the things I like to create uh, is that even the stories, sometimes they're very, they're always youthful, but it's like, cause I want people to feel like they're eating a gummy, but then the medicine is there. Um, no one wants to have a spoonful of Robitussin that tastes like shit be put into their mouth, no matter how good it is for you, you know? I'm, uh, yes, to all that. Um, it, I'm curious to what you and this friend were talking about with quote unquote spiritual things. Um, I, I'd like to ask that after I say this, cause you just said something that's super mirror of I had a business coach telling me about how I can basically I have these online courses that are like you know spur, oh, spiritual oh. and I'm like man you know I'm looking for ways to just be able to talk about bullshit and silliness and farting and my silly side that I feel like over the years I've somehow lost the ability to be super integral online like if you're in my life and I think the only person that you're so you. funny. Yeah. You're such a wonderful, like being around you is like, is literally, it's like going and playing basketball as a friend. And I don't play basketball. I mean, you literally do that, but I mean, like figuratively, it's like that level of fun being around you is playful. So I was talking to Bell about this recently and I'm a, a ridiculous human being. And same thing with Ted. Ted's a ridiculous, funny freaking person. But if you yeah. only see this kind of maybe right here, snapshot online, I don't know, it might be really aggressive or you might catch it at a frequency that it's just like, whoa, this is who he is. And you probably see plenty of that. And I felt like this idea of wanting to be artistic and then wanting to be really, quote unquote, spiritually calibrated have caused this slight kind of gap of integration. And Mm. Um, I've been aware of that and I've had people say that, you know, especially my mom be like, I think you just need to say it simpler. Can you say it simpler? What did you mean? Chakras? Non-duality. Yeah. I don't understand. You lost me at bioluminescence. <laughs> I'm like, fuck, but it is bioluminescence. How do I say elect? And then I talked to Jamuna and Jamuna is just like, yes, all of that. You get it. You got it. And I'm like, all right, but everybody's not Jamuna. So right, everybody's this, not Jamuna. This teacher just said, he's like, he's like, man, you obviously have it integrated personally because you're functioning with it and you're able to talk to individuals one at a time about it and assist them in their own calibration with it, which I enjoy doing that kind of work. But in terms of a, a language that's more palatable in general, in general, um, kind of got to simplify that shit a little bit more. And I, I feel that with, uh, anyways, from what you just said, it's like, it's got to be functional. It's got to be practical. No, no, no. Can you keep going there? Can, can, um yeah i mean you personally i want to know you because i feel like you can be so many different you can choose to be a poet you can be an actor you can be a designer you can be a musician you can be a video game savant you can be you can choose many lanes rockwell because you've got many interests many loves and many talents so but yeah, I guess I've never seen the playful Rocco other than like being in your presence. So since you can't literally be in everybody's presence, how are you going to take that level of play and bring it into a medium? Well, 
the other day we were about to walk into Target and um I had I mean I film stuff like this randomly here and there, but um I just took my phone out and did this. I pooped my pants and I did not judge myself. Let it run down my leg and it felt warm. Then I went into the bathroom and wiped it off. Luckily, Target keeps their bathrooms clean. So I don't know how the fuck that palates into the rest of my life, you know, but I'm uh, I'm figuring something out. I'm 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 wanting full authenticity and also integration and also functionality. Yeah. And one of the things that this beautiful coach also reflected back to me was like, I mean, let's just, I'm a, Hey, little therapy vibe from Matt to Rocco real quick. I'm, I would, I would love to be making a bit more money so that I'm able to do some of these other things that I know I have the capacity to do, but I'm also not spread too thin. And I know a lot of my bliss comes from delegating and being, I've been saying it a lot with some, some very close proximity, amazing goddess priestesses that are alchemically helping with some things um like love my love language is productivity and efficiency i love being efficient if i have a day where i'm like oh man that was i can't wait to do nothing now for the evening because the past you know 10 hours were just like lit and we checked off all these boxes and you know a good month like that feels good you know a good week like that feels great especially for probably hyper creative you know situations like you and i and this, this coach told me, he was just like, he's like, I think you have a bit of a scarcity signal and potentially inherited from your, you know, your childhood of like, you got to try and do everything that you possibly can do because you don't know where the money might come from and money, AKA abundance, AKA life source, AKA, you know, energy that's going to support yep. your well being, And, you know, um, if you can do it, you better. And yep. okay, great. I'm working on a video game great i have i mean god bless the universe greg which we have continued to not actually have spoken wow. too yeah. deep about that but have this amazing guru mentor brother mirror greg music okay great music's happening i'm making music i have other people's beats that i rap on sometimes sometimes i make the beats for other people sometimes i make beats for myself i am um um, I'm vetting screenwriters because I have about three that I want to write. And to be honest with you, I love the overview and I don't love the weeds all that, that much sometimes. So that. That. Fl flush out the structure for me. I'll fill in the stuff. Um, got that same thing with two different novels. I got these, I got, I got a couple pages on some novels and I'm like, fuck, I would love to just have someone help me fill this out into a 200 pager. Um, please take that note, whatever it is. Um, I got three things I got to jump in on. Keep going though. Keep going. Um, I, I have, I have two apps and I have a brother that's mirroring with me the app, the apps are dope and they could make so much, not just make money, but they're fucking great ideas that could literally be super helpful to a lot of people. To me, that's what really drives something. Mm -hmm. Um, I haven't told you this yet, but, um, I, ha I had this incredible mentor come and visit the ranch and he is head of, I don't know his technical term. Even? Yeah. Yeah. Like head of shoe design at Yeezy and works yeah. with Kanye like actively. And I'm like looking at him and I'm like, bro, can I just be honest with you? And he's like, sure. I was like, what are you doing here? Are you, are you hiring me? Or, or are we just like, you just want to meet Ted or I'm like going to work or what's going on. And it's like, then this is happening. That's really happening. What do you and say to that? I, he said, yeah. He said, you understand color and texture in a really fun futuristic exciting way and i think there's definitely some things um, something i don't know steven so so he, so he's like yeah we'll, we'll, there's some things happening and you know i'll probably tell you more but Amazing. there's yeah, there's, yeah. there's some things happening and we'll bring you in on this kind of project and then that kind of project and obviously yeah you'll end up probably hearing your beats and da, 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 da. i'm like yeah this is i've dreamt about this um actually for a long time so then yeah. these are all these different sectors and then mm -hmm. i got somebody that just dms me and says yo I, I know I need clarity and I, and for whatever reason, I'm being guided to reach to you about it. Mm -hmm. I'm like fucking so excited about that. I love walking with one person at a time, integrating mm -hmm. their trauma, seeing why it was given to them, call it Christ consciousness, Raja yoga, Kriya yoga, Siddha yoga, and or just Siddha and then moving into these deep states of clarity where, I mean, 
man, that shit lights me up. I also love working with somebody with psil- you know, psilocybin in particular, but yep. eating psychedelic integration can cross people through that boundary of confusion in a way that sometimes the waking state just, you know, certain minds are really rigid. Certain minds are a little bit more relaxed and pliable, but that client work, that shit lights me up. And honestly, it keeps me really humbled because it's like, mm-hmm. you know, can you assist this person in seeing what's blocking them and then give them a palatable experience to say, like as a, as a quote unquote, private, personal, blissful, selfish goal, I, I'm gardening an aha moment. That's yep. what I look yep. at it as gardening epiphany. It's like, if I can yep. help this person to go, oh, fuck, then that for me is like this really selfish orgasm where it's just like, nice, you're seeing it? Oh, yep. I see you seeing it. That feels as, good, doesn't it? As the recipient of one of those fruits from that garden, like I can say, yes, absolutely, man. So, like, so just in these couple of things, you just heard me point at, it's like, those are five different career paths for a, a quote unquote average, you know? Yeah. Sp- person or soul but for me it's like I'll feel like I'm missing out if I know that I'm not leaning into my potential and capacity because my capacity I feel my capacity is extraordinary and this brother this this mentor was like yeah and I think that might be causing you to loop into a plateau of scarcity and not just focusing on one thing and I was like fuck yeah I think you're right I gotta jump I gotta jump in here I got okay I'm going to start with this. I'm excited to hear whatever. It's a lot. Okay. So you said there's, you have five career paths. I'm going to start from there. If not, First of all, go Google Leonardo da Vinci. Go Google any of these dudes that you actually admire. Tell me how many different things they say they are. Do any of them say one? No. Who do you want to be? Do you want to just be a guy that says has one thing? No. So don't be that guy. Whatever. All right. Second of all, the universe is constantly expanding. And I say this because I think there's like a principle, that's a macro. The micro is that who's to say that these things in life are not consummate additives onto our life. We don't always have to be doing something where I feel like you have to say, eh, I'm not gonna choose, I'm, I, I can't do this, 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 because I only have to do this right now. A tree doesn't grow one branch at the same time. Like it grows branches at the same time, bro. Now. The way it does that is that its trunk is really fucking sturdy and its roots are deep in the ground. But once that happens and you have to decide, I'm saying this not just to you, but to the audience, everyone's got to decide amongst themselves. Like, are my, am I focusing on my roots right now? My trunk, do I have that? Am I sturdy? Boom, fucking fire, go. I think do them all because if they bring you bliss, if you're going to die tomorrow and you're doing all the things you love, who the hell can fault you for that? There are people that don't love anything. You love too many things? Fuck yeah. Go love all of them. And I bring it back to high school. I felt really good in high school. Here's why. Because in high school, I was so easy to do so many different things. I was involved in like, you know, the school's news, um, news broadcast every week where I not only got to be like constantly creating new content and I did like the digital short. So it was like narrative little like skits. So I like made it like a TV show and I did that every week and I felt like I get to show it to an audience and I got to laugh or hate it and I got to learn. And then I did the school plays at the same time and I got to be a weird character on stage and I was always the weird gnarly like supporting actors that would just be so out there. And then I also got to do a student government because I kind of like doing like that thing for a minute. And then I also was a part of campus ministry because I was very in touch with my spiritual side, which we'll talk about what spirit means because I I actually saw you perk up at that. I want to talk about that. And then, and I did all the, and then I did at the same time, but I also had to do high school. Like that's how I look at high school. And I forget that it's like, oh yeah, but most of that time was actually spent in class but I didn't even think about the class. I thought about all these other things that the class enabled me to do. So what I mean by that is when you go into your working life, if you take, I liked my experience. So I take that model and I put it into my professional life too. Sometimes I'm going to have to do school. I got to do the studying and the grades and the only one that can knock me for that is myself. I don't give a shit what anyone else says. If I got to do something to be able to pay my rent, but it allows me to do all the things that I love. And it's not, I'm not compromising morals. I'm not compromising anything like that, but maybe it's not exactly what I want to do. I just look back again at the Leonardo da Vinci's of the world at the, at the um, Michelangelo's like Leonardo da Vinci had to go design set props for the King to make some feeble income. So he could go invent dentistry in the nighttime. 
know what I'm saying? Like he had to do these jobs, create a catapult, what, the things he didn't want to do, but the only way he could survive. And then he went and did his art at night. And you know what? It worked out pretty great for him, at least because we're still talking about him. So I think every artist has to come to this threshold where they realize, how am I going to balance for myself what I do for Caesar and what I do for God? Give to God what belongs to God. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. It's in the Bible. It tells us what we need to know. You know what I'm saying? And there's no shame that we should have in having to do one because one can give us the other. But you have to never forget to give God to God. The problem is most people are only giving to Caesar. Now, one day, the giving to Caesar might completely disappear or your level of awareness will become that it's all for God, right? But, you know, not everybody, like, I'm not at the point where my only income is coming in because I'm making the imaginative science fiction fantasy feature film out in outer space that I want to make. That's not how I'm making my income. I got to go shoot commercials sometimes for people. I got to go do all kinds of projects that I don't wake up in the morning saying I want to go do that. But I made the choice to say, if I'm going to say yes to any of these, number one, I'm going to reinvest it immediately into what I'm doing. And I've stayed true to that. I made a lot of money off commercials last year for companies and products and things that I don't necessarily didn't wake up saying I want to do this. And I took that money and I put it straight into making an animated film last year, a short film last year on 16 millimeter film. I should have maybe put it into buying a house. Sorry, mom. But like, this is, this is what I have to do to like make my soul happy is I got to put it right back in because otherwise I had the moment where I was doing too much of that for Caesar stuff. And I was not happy. Like I was starting to be anxious, like angry at, at myself and at people. And I was like, and I had kind of had to like, be like, oh my God, man, you're not, whoa. All right. So I had to do the pivot. Right. But I just, I, I say all that. Cause I think that every person has to figure out in their own lives, what that split is. And Rocco, it's and we, you actually touched in with me about this a couple months ago. You wanted to talk about this. I remember the Marco Polo. I never got back to you. I don't think I was ready to talk about it then, but I'm ready to talk about it now. We're like, I know you sought me to, you asked, I want to know how you make money off doing what your passion is. Right. I remember that. And, uh, and I think this is my answer to you here. It's like, is, is that, you know, um, I know there are certain things that my skill sets can do that will make money, but I make the choice that I'm not just going to do them for money. I want to learn something each time. I did commercials for a, a fitness company. I never, like, I never in my million years thought I'd want to do that. But you know what? I go to, I go to a trainer two days a week now because I told myself that like, I'm going to take this experience and learn as a man from it. If I can't do it as an artist, if it's not helping me as an artist, it helped me as a man. And it did. And like, I was around all these trainers and talking about nutrition and health in a way that I was like, oh, you know, I should probably do this. And then I started doing it in my life. So that's not a loss. In fact, I'm super grateful. And I got to work with like bigger budgets and with more money. And the people that I met being able to work with bigger budgets are the people that I'm now taking and bringing them onto my passion projects. And we all met on this thing that I never thought I'd be doing in a million years. So you just don't, it's not like, what is the thing? It's what you take from the thing. It's not what the job is. It's what you take from the job. Like that's, that's the big, you know, so that's one for God and for Caesar. If, you, if it helps to put it up on your own whiteboard, I did it literally on my whiteboard for months. People would come in and be like, what the fuck does that mean? And I'd be like, don't worry about it. And then I kind of feel bad for the things I've put under for Caesar. But, you know, we all have to kind of, you know. And then, okay, so that's that. Real quick, Rocco, you have to write Moon Theory. You can you can let oh, everyone else do I'm the other things. I'm, I'm almost finished with chapter six. I'm, I'm I got somebody helping me edit it as we go. Uh, know that it's know okay. that your words are I don't know where they are, but I see them all the time. Uh, it's a sticky note at the ranch. It's a thing that I see on my laptop. It's a text that I text myself, and it's every time I say it or I write it, it's Matthew Thompson's words, and it's in all caps, and it says "Finish the book." I just, you said that like, I, I don't like writing and I want to farm it out and like everything else. Yes. But I know that you're okay. But I'm, yes. I'm sure, I'm sure that's not what you meant, but I was like, I hope you are the one writing. Moon which, theory. which for FYI, I have this incredible priestess helping me anchor it. Cause sometimes the writing is super flow early morning coffee, just yeah, yeah, yeah. and source. And I even got the dream about what to spend my next two hours in the morning writing, which I love those mornings. Literally that's how it happens sometimes. 
Um, other times I'm voice memoing it out and ha having someone maybe transcribe it because I can't touch it. I'm, I'm actually more so like exploring how to exactly get to the language with it and speaking it out sometimes for me is the, is the better mechanism to get there. Sometimes it is typing, but yes, to, to that point, it's yeah. happening. Oh, okay. I'm glad to hear that. Glad to hear that. I can't wait for that. I hope everybody, yeah, the world can't wait for that. Okay. And then I want to talk about words for a moment, therapy and spirituality. So you mentioned that you'd be in like therapy sessions with people. So, oh, actually, before we go there, can we, you want, can we close out the for God for, for Caesar thing? Does that feel good? Close out please, there. I'm really writing that down because it's a great sentence, but yeah, please. Okay. So yeah. Maybe, Ooh, maybe, yeah. maybe I give a quick reflection of my iteration of yeah. that because there's yeah, yeah, great yeah. codes in that. Um, yeah. I mean, when people say the Western world, I, I often call it Rome. When people say modern Christianity, I call it Roman. It's um, Rome literally has kind of been the place from which modern humanity is in a lot of ways coagulated from. And to this idea of like doing it for Caesar, it's like probably the same equivalent as what most people would call the matrix. And it's like, mm -hmm. you gotta yeah. you gotta hit in the boundaries of the box. And esoterically speaking, the box is Saturn. In the Saturn, there's 20, 24 hours in a day. You're only really awake during how many of them. And you're only going to be really actually productive during this many of them. And you only got so much that you can do to make money and you got skill sets. So it's like, you better be doing something with your time and your energy that's going to get you paid. And that might not always synchronize with what really feeds your soul. But having that navigation of that comparison of, is this worth it? What's the ROI? What's my return on investment of this thing that I know I really don't get lit up doing, but you know what? I could be doing something that I really hated doing. And this is not that bad. I could be, you know, in a different timeline and a totally different lifetime. So, Hey, let me knock this out as a responsibility, call it chores. This is what my chore is. And then I'm going to take that. And I was also talking to Bell about this as well. It's like, I'm not the dude to just be like, Oh, cool. Now let's just really get tight and save up for the next six months it's like i got a grand man i think i should do this project and it's like yeah like, someone would probably say like relax it's like that's not what i'm here for not in that way and now since you know that about yourself on the equal end of that is you need to be bringing in more Excellent. often grands because you want to put them out so like that's rocco that's Rocco. You're uniquely you. doesn't matter how everyone else does their shit, right? You do it that way. You want to put it out because you want to create things. So that means you got to put, bring some things in. And I, and I think no one, and, and it, it's actually really, you really started the theme of this with that whole New Year's resolution thing, because it is like that too. You have to take stock of what's right in front of you. And this is, and this is also something to the last sentence you said is what's right in front of you is you and having, and this is something I've seen you as well as like self-awareness is a huge piece of noticing what's actually relevant to dive into and spend your time and energy on and what might be those moments where you say we don't got time for that shot that's a great idea but it's it's just not it um yeah. on set you're like shit we got to make up time we got to cut those two we can't cut those two shots i wanted those shots you're like i i love those shots just as much as you we don't got time right now let's 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 talk about it later zoom amen. right now amen i mean look look at trees look at plants look at my beautiful plant my plant does not it cannot leave where it is. It is dependent upon utilizing what is directly around it. <sighs> cannot move. We have everything we need directly around us at all times. Eventually, you'll catch wind of something and move on to some great journey that will take you elsewhere from where you're at. But the only way you catch that, that flight is you walk right in front of you to get onto the plane. Like nothing, it's always right in front of you. So like, even when we graduated college, Matthew Law and I, we started our company, The Mats. The way we were able to fun function as a company, pay all of our dope friends money that were trying to like just get started with their jobs. We made videos for our university. We didn't look anywhere other than right in front of us. LMU, your videos, we kind of think we can make them doper. If we saw dope videos, we probably would have chosen the school more. We make dope videos, you have a lot of money. Can you pay us to make videos? And so we literally, that's how we started our company. And then we took all that investment that we made from LMU. We got our tuition money back, basically, for all the things we made. We, we, now we're where we are, you know what I mean? And now we work where we are. Like, we didn't look much further. And I think people, that's something that they actually just right now, I think I just connected in my head. 
by just speaking out loud was like, that's really the thing, man. It's like, it's right. The things are right in front of us that lead us to the next things. It's just half the time we're not seeing them. So the New Year's resolutions, it's just being able to see what you have right in front of you and appreciate it and utilize it properly. Because we are like a plant. We are given all we need right where we are in our little bed of soil. Only there can we start to grow and start to reach kind of, you know, a little bit, a little bit closer to the sun. So, you know, Rocco, for you, man, like I'm excited to see for you, there's so much right around you and, and, and there is so much because what's right, because you have a lot of circles now, you've really expanded, you know, your, your energy into a lot of places. And so, you know, what you do to find that and find a home with that and find grace and find like, you know, I don't know, no, no one, no one can tell you the right way to balance the things that you're meant to say through your heart, through your art, and the things that you're meant to do as a duty to survive and be functional. And I think the the blessing, the, the thing at the end of the day is, at least what I've come to only looking back realize is all the things that I thought I was only doing for the functional to survive, every one of those things did something important for the art that I ended up creating. Major lessons, major keys, major ingredients that you use somewhere else. Like lessons, learning how to deal with conflict, learning how to deal with standing up for yourself, learning how to deal with management, learning like all those are basics. And then you can get nuanced, learning how, what it feels like when you get let down on like something that's like learning what it feels like when you thought you didn't want something and then it decides to be like, we don't want you and being like, oh shit, that's what that feels like. Ugh. You know, like you kind of can learn lessons through here and then the art, you know, you can kind of, you know, employ the, the more wise version of what you learned. So I don't know, man, it's all in the same wheelhouse. Um, but, but you, 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 you brought up this thing about spirituality and how, I knew where you were going with it is that like there isn't a separation in a sense between what you call spirit spirit right or spiritual and just everything and then there's a, and maybe and I want to go there I want to hear what you have to say about that and then there's the word therapy you're saying I was doing a therapy like all right Matt you said Matt we're going to do a little therapy now and it's also like therapy I think can go hand in hand with this where it's like therapy equals deep questions or unearthing traumas or doing all these things but it's kind of like man that's the more that's the most real level of communicating you can do how is that not how is that not more communicating than communic than just communicating like why does that have to have its own category when it's actually like the thing that very much unites all of us that and the fact that we all have certain level of therapy we have to go through and we all are going to die are kind of the only two things we can kind of all relate with each other on. And yet they're the two things that nobody likes to actually discuss, which I get that. Like, I don't like going into therapy with people. I don't really know. Like, I'm not trying to say we should do that, but I just want to hear your reflection on that. You know, the, the, the potent baton that you just lodged in my pineal, pineal heart is you said, why, why do we talk about therapy as, oh, it's this deep thing. Yeah. My question to that is, because, oh, my, my answer to that question, hmm. I'm going to say it smoothly. Why most of us have called therapy a deep conversation style of navigating what's, quote unquote, maybe unpleasant is because most of us, and it's how society has guided us and grown us to be, most of us only live as Caesar's citizens. Mm. We're not encouraged to live as our soul. Mm. Even in religious, at least in my up upbringing in Christianity, there's your spiritual life and it stops in these particular sectors and maybe not supposed to but again the world grows us into saying this is these boundaries and then my closet the clothes go here i don't take a shit on my bed i do it in the toilet it's it's or in it's, your pants in a target or in my pants hopefully 
Although for some reason, the Rocco diagnostic system loves talking about pooping in pants on things that you shouldn't poop on. I think it's part of my genius and my bliss is just scrambling where things are supposed to go. Um, and so, okay, so therapy, when I said the therapy thing, I was really, I was really saying like, Matt, give Rocco some therapy because this is something that we were, you know, the whole thing of, the whole thing of, um, what this coach had told me was just like, yeah, you're, you're obviously brilliant, bro, but like focus. <laughs> and I'm, and I hear that. And then, you know, I talk to Bell about it and it's just like, so what am I supposed to do? Like not make beats? Like I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Although for at this point in my, in my experience of journey, I feel like I do not effort at putting any momentum against what's organically flown there's a handful of things that I just make myself do because it's timeline written or honestly moon theory is like the longest marathon project I've ever done. But like, I don't make myself make beats. I only make beats or I make music when that shit is sparking up. Although now with Greg, Greg's this mirror of accountability of like, you know what, um, as an artist, like as a brand, like you need to be getting these kind of things and they might not be the most fun creative projects, but like they're technical things and it's going to help get you some more traction on the social media. It's about getting your craft tight, practicing for live performances, like, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. you know, perform just to the camera. And like, it's not a music video, just like rap to the camera and like put that shit out. And I, I, I hear it. And also it ends up being thing that's inspired. So I, I look to navigate the the resistance portals and the inspiration portals and kind of getting them closer together it's actually one of the first notes i took when we were talking um wu wei gardening interrupting an environment as little as possible mm -hmm. while still curating its potential to the highest level wow i love that can i actually can we stay on that subject of what you just talked about which is this sort of like organically flowing with something versus pushing something resistance wise before we go to the other things. Mm -hmm. Can I reflect on that real quick? Please, please. Because I have no, I'm in process with that balance as well. So I'm just going to speak to real time observations of myself and the people that I'm inspired by, such as a George Lucas, who literally, I have a sticky note right here on my desk that says bleed on the page. And that's George Lucas, what he had to do through Star Wars, because he hated every second of writing it. He just knew he had to do it, but he fucking hated it. And it was like every day, the worst thing in the world was sitting down and having to write it and look at how much we get to benefit because he went through that suffering. So I have that node in my head of like, okay, Which that is, that is the ultimate frequency of the Christos template. Any, it's not just Jesus. This is to me is the main modern Roman Catholic trauma. It's not just for Jesus. It's the mirror template for what all of us can do in our highest alchemy possible. And so anyone who's done, what, yeah, what do you mean by that? What does that anyone mean? Anyone who has done their highest alchemy possible, which esoterically in the occult tradition, they call it the great work. Anyone who's done the great work has brought something forth to humanity that triumphs more than one person could ever be responsible for mm -hmm. because they made a sacrifice and they laid their skeleton on the cross, which is also like a crosshair, and they brought something forth that was going to be valuable. And then through their suffering, others can benefit in value. That's the template of the Christos. Man, and that's the part of George Lucas's story that I feel like not a lot of people either know or talk about, but that man was literally in the hospital, had a nervous breakdown, had a heart attack, almost died. The doctor said, you either will keep working on this film and die, or you have to stop and give yourself a break. Oh, I didn't know that. And listen to Blockbuster, the podcast. It's brilliant. It's a scripted oh. podcast about the discover the founding of the Blockbuster. And it was about Star Wars and Jaws happening at the same time between Spielberg and Lucas. It's scripted, but it's super heavily researched and it's, it's really entertaining. But oh, it's made cool. by Epiclef Media. They did a great job. But Lucas literally was like, got finished film. And fucking, like no one talks about like the man literally chose death to make the film and everybody thought it was shit and everyone thought it was going to fail. He thought it was going to fail until he heard John Williams music in the scoring session. And he started crying. He's like, Oh my God, this might actually work. You know what I mean? Like, wow. and John Williams did the same thing to Jaws. 
Spielberg was really doubting it. He's like, oh my God, people are blah, 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 blah. And then John Williams does his music. And, and he's, so John Williams is kind of the secret sauce there. Wow. But the, the node to take from that is George Lucas, and it's, it's fitting because he was so into the Joseph Campbells of the world and the literal hero's journey. Like he knew that stuff more than anyone, but I think he was so touch, like he's a perfect example of the true alchemist, somebody that really went to the brink. And, and it's hard to like, you don't want to fetishize that. You don't want to say like everyone needs to be at the point of death to be able to create something great. And that's, what's really difficult is you can't like say that you should do that or advocate for that. And yet at the same time, the truly great stuff took that. So, you know, how do you live in a society where you obviously don't want to be propagating one thing because you want to encourage everyone's mental well being and health. But at the same time, you're like, how do you teach resilience at the same time and say, it's not going to be all roses and butterflies. It's going to suck some of the time and you have to do it anyway. Well, like, this is also, this is also where the Caesar lifestyle ends for God's lifestyle or your, your, your Caesar citizenship ends where your God's child lifestyle begins, which is you got to have conviction. You have to have some kind of a relationship to this eternal river source that's flowing through your heart that the world might not recognize as valuable. Actually, contradictorily, contrastingly, the world might literally demonize you, call it crazy, call it a waste of time. Your friends and your family might lose relationships, but you are connected to this thing that's inside of you, making your heart beat strong. And even you might not be able to cross the finish line without other mirrors telling you, no, you're doing the thing that you need to do. Trust yourself or thing or me or even whatever. Keep going. So uh, yes to that. Yes to that. Yes to that. Uh, yeah. So we can head back into the other. Where well, we this is a bridge. This is the bridge of therapy and spirituality because, you know, yeah. you know, someone, I mean, this is where my quote unquote beginning of a therapist began um which is like i don't i think that line that that phrase even has like such heavy connotations with it that it's actually less attractive for people to talk about it sometimes it's like oh yeah i i, I see a therapist i've mentioned that before it's like i have a therapist but well, you're a therapist you can't have a therapist it's like damn that's such a fucked up thing in society that's like you have a therapist are you are you broken it's like damn all of us should be going to therapy. All of us need some educated mirror to help us process what's going on metaphysically, emotionally, mentally, and often physically. That's what a massage therapist can do. And a good massage therapist would be like, hmm, what's going on right here in the top right of your shoulder? Like, oh, no, I'm not sure. You start talking about a thing that's not just physical. It's connected to these other dimensions of your life. But to me, this is where integrated spirituality happens pragmatic spirituality mm -hmm. it's not supposed to just be spirituality but it stays as that when it's not integrated because most are living as caesar citizens most are living as physical identities and mental identities psychological personas that then have a spiritual experience or spiritual life mm -hmm. that phrase of like uh we're spiritual beings living a human experience most that's not true most people are human beings who maybe have a spiritual experience here and there, but like for the reality of at least in people that I've experienced, it's, it's a, it's an unknown territory, their spirituality. And so having someone that's a guide in the modern world, you know, uses psychotherapy and, and the, the therapist as the in-betweener. But I told you about that experience that I had in Denver. It's like, that's why I got called there. Not everybody's called to like eat five grams of psilocybin and like in the middle of a thunderstorm and, look at their shit, look at their own demons so that then anytime you see a demon in someone else's life, you can help them discern the difference between that's not you though. That's not you, sweetheart. I, I can see who you are and that's not you. That's something that happened and it didn't happen to you for no reason. It happened for you, but it's time that you integrate that and you stop suppressing that into a segment of your life. But see, this is where an artist steps in and says, you know what? I can't wait for someone to show me that aspect about myself. I have to dig that up. And maybe you get somebody to help you. And it sounds like, you know, Mr. Lucas needed somebody to help him as well, which I think that's, that's the point. When you really get serious, you realize it's bigger than me. You know, Yeshua probably hit a moment where he's like, damn, there's only so much I could say about myself. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if his channel was like, bing, find 12 who would carry your message. There will be one who betrays you. I don't know how exactly how it happened for him, mm -hmm. but 
you know, um, I'm sure for all of us along the way, we're like, damn, what is the thing that is, and this is even how I came into this conversation. I probably maybe should have said it at the top of the conversation with you, but it's like, what is the absolute most fucking important thing that we could fucking talk about, live about, look into and dive into possible? What's the most important thing that we could spend our time on? This is somehow how I, this is sometimes how I start a, a session. What's the most pressing thing? That's kind of how I say what's, what's present for you in your life, what's on the you know, past five days. It's kind of, I, I started it with a more gentle scenario at this, on this call, but that's how, that's how sessions for me start. It's like, what if we died tomorrow? What's super relevant? What's most relevant? What's the most important thing that's happening for you? And maybe it's something that's inspiring and it's moving up, up towards, you know, it's already happening, but maybe it's just moving in towards not happening, which is a block. An energetic block is that. And I would say that this is where therapy and spirituality start crossing over. But um, I jumped in, maybe you have some other directions. There. Well, I was just trying to answer that in my head about, you know, what would, what would my answer be to that, you know? And, uh, About what? About what? What would be the single most fucking important? Thing? All right, may, may I, may I, you know, zoom in a bit? Yeah, I mean, yeah. And let me know if I touch on any like, you know, um, yellow tape areas or whatever. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Your relationship with filmmaking and the military and your dad, who's not in physical form anymore, but is so in your heart, and it takes you to this deep place of storytelling not like a storyteller, like a missionary, and that leaning into this craft, and then you, re you relate to, you know, people that are close, you know, love life, but then that all shows up in your work, and your level of fulfillment, so now we have the, your, your externalized energy forces, and your internalized energy forces, and where they meet in the place that you feel like is the most blissful opportunity to expand into the next octave of your life, I would say that that is the, the county line, of what's most inspiring and what's not super relevant to even give mental calories to. I did a, I did a general sweep on several different things, but. And you know what I'd say, I'd say is FOMO is what guides us into what's most important and what's, what's most relevant to spend our energy and our attention and our time on. And it's not always what we feel like is missing, but what we feel like we need more of or what we feel like we want more of. Hmm. I mean, I, I'm, I'm four and a half steps away from taking it into a deep somatic experience for you. So I'm gonna pull off the gas pedal on that. But that's, you hear what I'm pointing though. It's like, mm -hmm. you, can, you can get in a drill. You ever watch that? Well, maybe it was just a cartoon. It was this episode, what was it? It was the OG 1990s Ninja Turtle movie. And one of the bad guys had this big drill. And it was just drilling. I always saw that, Im that image is like, whoa, you know, you have a drill that you hold in your hand and you like push it into wood and it makes a hole. But like a drill that 20 people could get into. I think there's a movie called The, um, the Sphere. It was like one of those 1990s or early 2000s, like sci-fi movies, like Armageddon and The Abyss and... Um, you know, Red Planet. It was one of those. Where it was like all these people. The Core. I think there's a movie called The Core. And there's like all these scientists, and they're like in a freaking drill. That's like yeah, yeah, The Core. Like, yeah, like yeah. a spaceship, and you're yeah, drilling. Love that movie. Yeah. So this is this is where I think you get to it. Is you look at your heart, and you say, as a mirror, and this is also one of the things that I've been taught, and is a teaching that moves through me as an awareness. And a teaching is really just an unintegrated awareness. And then it becomes a learning or a lesson. You look at the tip of your heart, because it's the tip of your tongue, you're about to say something. You look at your heart, you look at what's empower, empowering you, important to you, great aesthetic change. Just the power of different Just lenses. Lens. Hey, the power of different lenses. It's very, uh. and you say, where the fuck is this going? And that gives trajectory, even if it's only yards or feet. 
but trajectory is an analysis of posture. Posture is technically angle. Posture mm -hmm. is mathematic, angular awareness. Because if I looked at your body and you're like this and you got like a hunchback and you're really fucked up and you're like, you got some shit going on, I'd say, where's this going? And mm -hmm. that, that could be indicative of something. You know, and then you tell me, man, Rock, remember I told you I was working out, you know, a trainer two times a week. I work out with a trainer four times a week and I just did my first marathon and I was directing my first feature film. And I'd say, where's this going? Mm -hmm. Now, this is technically no longer exactly what I think you were pointing at with like therapy. And then that's an ended conversation and spirituality is a different thing. But um, this is where we this is this is where we've come. That's where we come. Yeah. I mean, you know. I mean, you know me, you know, and I don't, you, and you know, like the people that, that I've met and that you've met and how kind of magical it all kind of can be at the end of the day. But yeah, I don't know if I'm ready for your listeners to, to know that part of me, but you know, my, my, you know, like there's a, there's definitely this you expressed it really beautifully. The space between what is like the sort of inner experience and then these outer experiences and then the point at which the two of them can like the inner forces and that point is is where, yeah, I feel like I can create and it, and it makes more sense, I should just say, or it, it feels more viscerally comprehensible in this place. Tangible. Tangible. Um, well, is there, is there a baton to the, you, you were going to, I think, zoom in on something specific with spirit or the definition of spirit or spirituality or something like that specifically, or did that, did, the, did my baton take you elsewhere? Dude, your baton took me so far elsewhere. I had to like put on new glasses. I saw that. I just, I just didn't, it didn't feel like I wanted to wear these glasses anymore, but you know what? These ones, the thing is the pads on these guys broke off. So oh. they actually really hurt to put on. Man. But, I like wearing these when I write. Um, it's so weird, different. Like literally, you know, they say like, oh, put on your like producer hat, put on your director hat when you got to do different things. I literally have like different pairs of glasses I'll put on and, and I literally feel like I'm getting into character to be that role. And then I can do it way easier. Like when I have to go from like a budget to writing a script, like I just put on a new pair of glasses and then works like magic. You about to show me you got glasses too? Show me your glasses. I have two. I literally traveled with two pairs of glasses. And this pair, you were with me and I'm blown away. And boy, boy, oh gosh, golly, gosh darn. These these things might need a replace because oh, they've dude. got they've got so many marks on them. Like this is just a section of me, like like pebbles hit them. Like I've been having these on, and like a pebble will just hit me from like those a car. Right. Even when you retire those, you have to keep them. Like those, those belong in a museum. These really feel like um, there was this like goofy movie, like Disney, literally like Mickey, Minnie, Goofy. And, and yeah. he, he wore some like this. And I, I, remember yeah, as a kid, yeah. I was just like, I need those glasses. And he had a yellow outfit too, funny enough. But I was like, I need those glasses. And, and then I think my pops wore these in the 90s. And like, I think he was just like legend vibes when, when I saw him. So this is a silhouette. For me, this is, this is my like, if there's sun in the sky vibe. Okay. And then... Um, you know, the blue light, you know, the blue light really affects our, uh, some kind of chemical release in the system, but, uh, he's got blue light protection. And when I'm writing, these are, oh, that's a vibe. That's a vibe. I like that. Dope. Does that actually help the blue light? Does, have you, you, you used this? Yeah, there's a, they came with like a little light. I think I, have, huh. but they came with a light that literally it's a blue light and you have a piece of paper underneath, you know, this, the lens. Mm -hmm. This is all extremely potently spiritual. What we've been talking about with lenses and things, especially yours that don't have pads anymore. And then mine that have dents and marks on them. Um, you point the blue light at it. Yeah. And on the, on the paper, it's like a certain color. You take it away and the blue light's powerfully blue. Put it back on and it's like, oh wow, uh, not as potent. So yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, man, I mean, that just gets into the whole thing too of like, you know, you know, to me, the conversation about even UFOs and about a lot of that work that I did is part and parcel with a spiritual conversation. I mean, I think I felt more 
visceral spiritual growth working in that subject matter and talking to the people that I talked to and the interviews that I was a part of than really anything else. I mean, talking about the idea that a lens can block a certain frequency of light or a certain shade of light, you know, I mean, think about the animals that live in the ocean or these things that can see certain colors that we can't see. They can hear certain sounds we can't hear. And like, do we say those things don't exist because we can't, you know, the conversation of talking about things in general that some people believe aren't real. Let's just, let's just strip it down to its most basic. You're having a conversation when you talk about spirituality, about things that some people think are real and aren't real because they either have a tangible visceral experience of it in what they call three-dimensional reality, like I'm having this experience with you, or it's a separated plane of the extraordinary. And that's what people like, that's what we like to do. Okay, so UFOs still fall into that. It's this segment. thing of like segment. It's a segment, right? And and it's just and what we don't realize, like just because, you know, are you saying that the color that this type of animal can sense doesn't exist because we don't experience it, and that maybe if there's some humans that have that ability to experience it, like that animal does, in its own way, that it's not just as you can't just equally take that into consideration that just because not everybody can experience something doesn't mean the thing isn't happening right like you open up a big rabbit hole there that can get a lot of people into you know psychosis even because they go way down the tunnel i'm not saying get ungrounded and do all that work i mean that you know to each his own but i just think you have to kind of understand with a little bit of humility that there are things we don't understand maybe they're ufos Maybe they're all these things. Maybe they're the stories and the mythologies that we try to point at, the forces we reckon with, or the unseen, or the gods, all these things, like all that stuff, whatever it is, there's a big unknown category that we have to deal with and be okay with in our existence. It's getting clearer because we are growing and evolving and understanding more. Again, let's take the UFO conversation. Back in the Roman days, talk about everything came from the Roman world, they called them flaming shields. Because at the time, their context of what visually they could connect to a UFO was, oh, that must be a flaming shield going across. Or flying, the flying chariots with many wheels. There's, yep, all kinds, yeah, all, there was all, all sorts of things. I mean, this is a Vatican scholar that told me that one, which is insane. Now, you, you call them Tic Tacs. They look like little drones, totally metallic, and they zip around. It's interesting. I mean, we've got a bunch of drones now technology. We understand this kind of like, it's interesting that the way we explain these things has changed with our own understanding of the material world around us. So, you know, when people are trying to say, oh, God's not real, look at quantum physics and all these things. It's like the real brilliant guys at the end of all their calculations came up with the fact of, fuck, God's at the end of this. You know what I mean? Like, that there is still that unknown category and the same level of equations you come up with to explain the creation of things through string theory kind of mirrors beats and plot points of some of the greatest mythologies from the Near East from way back when. You know what I'm saying? Like, like they, they, we're still saying the same thing. We're just pointing at the truth through different languages, through different meanings. But at the end of the day, it's all this. So spirit, yeah. Go ahead. The degree in which we know that which allows us knowing. Yeah. Will be the degree well, at which we know anything. Yeah. AKA yeah. the degree at which I know myself will be the degree at which I'm able to know anybody that I interface with. What? Well, th th this is, oh, ooh. Eh, eh, ooh. Ah. This is what I like. This is what I like working with a camera because you are viscerally aware of that. There are two things when you make a film happening at the same time. Simplify. Okay. There is the camera. There is the subject. Okay. This reminds me how small I am. Okay, there's these two things. Now, 
you can move your camera. I've I, Rock, we've talked about this, but I, I think this is the perfect bridge. You can move your camera, and if you move the camera around here, you can film different angles of this subject, right? We learn close-ups, wide shots, movement, all these things. It reveals some other part of this. But the thing is, if this camera, if the lens is out of focus, or if it's not exposed properly, you can put it anywhere you fucking want, and it'll look like shit. You have to have your lens focused right. You have to have it exposed right. And then you see it a lot of different angles. So it makes me viscerally aware that the experience of living is number one, we are the camera. Are we exposed right? Are we in focus? Are we truly seeing a clear image? And only then can we worry about the different parts of life we're looking at. But if that part isn't figured out right, you know, like, I, I think it's kind of what you're saying. Now, the thing is, people might be sitting, you know, a lot of people are like, well, I don't even under, I'm never going to know myself. What does that mean to know yourself? No one knows themselves, you know? You can get into that whole, you know, thing. But I, I, I think, you know, it's like what you're saying. People just maybe aren't as accustomed to keeping the idea of uh, this self-actualization in their vocabulary from day one, you know? And that's maybe a gift to have that although I don't think anyone actually gave that to me I kind of was born with that I don't know about you but like no one around me was like talking about self-actualization and spiritual like all these things like if anything I was sort of more of an island about it most of my life than than others so I don't know if that's something that you're like born into from environment or if that's truly something from I don't know you seek out yourself that's another conversation but um anyway yes to what you said the camera you yourself you have to be tuned right focused right to see life and maybe right and wrong is the wrong thing i mean technically you change your exposure and your focus on a camera and sometimes it makes things just look different and it just makes it look cooler you know like but there is two levels of capturing happening there's this there's an object and then the subject and, and both are in a dance with each other right yeah baton Maybe it's not you, but have you, have you worked with like a cinematographer or a DP that's, that's for those who don't know, that's the person who's like the master of the camera, aware of lenses, all the camera things, the director's like guiding the whole thing, but the cinematographer is really the camera specific ninja. Yes? Yes. Have you worked with the cinematographer that is, we don't have to go into it, but just referencing and making a bigger point here. Have you worked with a cinematographer that is the most knowledgeable cinematographer you've ever met in your life? Yes. So could you imagine that there's anything on a screen that's happening and you could ask them, and I'm sure you could probably do this to a large degree as well. And myself to probably a lesser degree as I'm less familiar with this particular medium. Yeah. But there is a, anything on the screen, movie screen, TV screen. And Matt says to this person, who's a cinematographer, what lens is that? And this is the style of a person that's so familiar with this medium and this art form that they could probably say, if not exactly this or this or this. Yeah. Yeah. So this is where Raja Yoga changed my life because I stopped relying on someone else's story or experience. And I became perceptive of what gave me knowledge or what gave me experiential, tangible information. Mm. I stopped listening or looking for, actually I didn't. I'm always interested in how someone else's spiritual awakening happened, which spirituality for me, I would say stopped being spirituality and it became an awakening because mm. an awakening is more so like, not was always right here. You know, um, my, um, oh, I'm about to be silly or we'll see how it goes. Um, well, I'll just follow it. Let's see what happens. So my tabling was when I realized that there is this table underneath me. And prior, I just never realized that my laptop had to sit on this thing. It's like, my, I thought my laptop was just in front of me, but I've realized that there's this table and this table is, that's the counter. You know, and that's a coffee table but tables are such a big part of my life. And I never thought about it before, about how much I use tables. But now every time I interact with the table, because I had a table experience, now I see the grain of wood or the plastic or the material, whatever it is, 
the shapes and the angles are they rounded edges tables what what uh design era does this design language of a table come from the height of the table are they central uh anchored or are they anchored by four pole etc cetera, etc cetera. you can hear kind of where i'm going i had a table awakening to the nature of tables so because i understood something about one table and i had this experience i had a teacher one time that would always just say well after my experience da, 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 da. and finally one day i said what was your experience because he kept mentioning it. it's probably a, a you know a subtle lure to lure me in with that but once i had this experience of a camera lens to the deepest degree possible some would maybe call that person a cinematographer master or a camera master and maybe they're humble about it but they're they freaking know cameras probably the top 0.0001 percent of humanity right this is a thing like i'm sure there's a person out there that's literally that you could you could probably call someone yeah this to me is where self-awareness happens self-awareness as a human happens here self-actualization is what you do with the self out in the world Self-awareness is kind of a, a sector of awareness and se a sector of maturity that looks at the self. Um, you know, this is kind of where also the sector of mental health lives. It's like, oh, I have to be healthy. My self-awareness dictates the level of consciousness that I conduct myself with in all of my maneuvers, all of my behaviors, all of my ticks and quirks and things like that. Um, self realization is kind of a sector prior to self-awareness but you could say that they're all derivatives of the same thing it's all with the self but in humanity most of us have been indoctrinated into realizing the wrong thing because we are emphasized as being citizens of, of caesar and not child of god and child of god is sectored as your spiritual experience but what mm -hmm. i wanted more ep epiphany around was what is the base of all experience What's the base of all table, all table, every table ever. I want to be able to understand every table in existence. So no matter what table I'm in front of, I understand the table because I'm a table educated person. But we're talking about now, we're talking about the spiritual experience. The spiritual experience just means the experience of the soul self. The soul self is mostly not integrated with most people. So their personhood is primary their soul self is secondary. Does that make sense? Yeah. This is what really got me interested because I saw somebody as my dad who did the most with their person. They did the thing. I would hear it as a kid in school. They'd be like, well, I'm, I'm no rock star, but da, 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 da. Well, I'm not a rocket scientist, but blah, 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 blah. Who do you think you are? A, ro a rocket scientist? But we want to be a rock star one day. Da, 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 da. It was, it was those two things that stood out in my head. And it's part of my testimony is like, why is that idealized so much? Well, it's kind of a freaking rare thing. It's pretty cool. You just get on stage. You get people want to see you just do, you play your song. You love your song. You're having fun on stage. You're just doing pretty, you get paid to have fun on stage. A lot of other things go into it. But I looked at that close hand and I was like, what goes into that? And why'd that happen to this guy? Why I got put next to it is a whole nother thing. But what's the ingredients that allow for this I like the word epitomization of human potential. Mm. And what's the difference when someone's in a deep, deep level of despair, depressed, running from their problems, suppressing their feelings? I mean, I've seen this guy burp and fart and scream and yell and, and be emotional in public, almost as if he has permission to just bleed on the page of life and call it being an artist or call it being an actualized or a realized person to the degree at which they are, there's something happening there that is an anomaly for most people. That's an enigma for most people. That's not a common thing. It's uncommon. Um, so getting into the, I mean, I, I took the baton. I went, I went. I, I got a, re I got a, re a reflection there. Please. Fonz, yeah. Um, do you, I actually have a question for you based off all that. Do you feel like we are able to have these kind of conversations and are somewhat 
blessed that what we have chosen to do, which is be as even for Caesar, an artist, our profession, our trade is an artist. So all these conversations about spirituality and God and all these things, for us, it's relatively easy to kind of all kind of have a collapse into the same ness. But like, if our dharma or our however you want to explain it was called to be an accountant or was called to be something where it's a lot more difficult to be like taking all this into that what do you have to say to those individuals even the people listening that like aren't artists by trade but like they're you know we talk about this and it's like we're bringing it into everything we live and do and every you know but what about everybody else that that separation like does exist like they've got hr you know what i mean they've got like I'm a zero point. I'm a zero point for you. Is is that the baton? That's it. Yeah. The vocation your soul is unconsciously driven into before any kind of quote unquote higher octave realization is a reflective as contrast to the degree in which you need your realization. Wordy sentence, but let me zoom into it more. I just did a a series of sessions with someone who works in law, which is similar to in a lawyer. It's, I mean, I'm sorry, lawyer, accountant, you know, something very, very in the matrix. Talk about Caesar's, you know, citizen, like their mastery is for Caesar specifically, like the measurement of money, the measurement of law, the measurement of the commas. And then this was the hyperbole. You know, the hyper, hyper, it's all very much in the call it the, the weeds of the matrix, law, money, numbers, accountants, that, that kind of thing. Um, I worked with this brother, gave him some sessions. He was like, I want more. And I'm like, I think psilocybin and a deep, deep brotherhood breakthrough vibe is what's calling you. And I'm ready for you, but um, I, I gotta go to, I gotta go back to Texas. And they're like, I'll meet you there. And they drove from San Diego to Texas. And we had a three day dive in and it was this huge, incredible epiphany breakthrough. I'm leaning on their elbow, I'm leaning with my elbow on their abdomen as they're like seeing this blockage that came from childhood and something with the, the, the different thing that this dad was doing, this idea of having to try. And it was like this idea and this identity was in the throat and I'm pushing it up through the throat and they're like, ah, ah and I'm pushing my elbow into their, uh, into their solar plexus and pushing the rest of it out as they're releasing this energy through their vo- voice and emotion just pops. It was already coming, but then it pops. The degree in which the lawyer or the accountant or the mathematician or the teacher or the janitor identity is calcified around the soul creates a contrast of unfulfillment buildup. And it creates this, uh, I've been calling it lately, it's a term that really anchored in the middle of 2021, the summer. I've been calling it the bowling ball and the trampoline. That's really all I call it. Um, Because anything else around the trampoline will, right? This is what gravity does. Spiritual gravity is technically the same thing, but flipped. Shout out to Stranger Things, the upside down. This physical world matrix, which hyper sidebar, but shout out to dear brothers, Travis Scott. And unfortunately what happened at that, you know, festival happened. And if he didn't know, that's unfortunate too, but all the signs are that he was a participant in some alchemy and in some, you know, some ancient, ancient pathways that come with real sticky karma and real sticky association. Um, Because if you notice and you let people know that you're functioning in the upside down world, you know, this is why upside down crosses are used in shadow magic is because they have to let the participant know who that is. This is why I recognize the cross as who I am. It's why you probably like the cross. You start hanging out with somebody who's got a tattoo. Right side up. Yeah. If, yeah. You start, if you start hanging out with me and you haven't seen me in a couple of years, I got an upside down cross in my head. You're probably not going to be able to bypass this incredibly um, unfortunate symbol. I'm like, Rockle, let's talk. Let's talk. Rockle, Rockle, Rockle let's what on. the fuck is going on? Okay. So there's guys, there's guys going on tour yeah millions of dollars and their only set design is just upside down cross was that his was that one of his set designs uh i don't know if he's super used that before but there's no not 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 per se that i can say at that festival okay you're just saying in general there's like uh yeah i would say that there's a quote quote unquote guilty by association and a a kind of a, a 
a quantum entanglement because of other codes that he have he has used and it's like you know nothing happens without reason there is cause and there is effect and that festival was a situation and but hold on before i get too too deep into it the yeah. gravity in this world is what we understand as an obvious law spiritual ascension for me is just as an obvious as a law and it and it comes from talk about me practicing speaking very practical and not getting lost in the church very practically the need for growth is as real as the need to shit poop out of your asshole say that one more time for the people in the back thank you thank you the need for growth and this means spiritual, emotional, mental, physical growth. If you're not growing, you're quote unquote fighting the nature of your life, which is to grow. If it's not, it's in, I think, muscle, the, the muscular term for it is atrophy. If you don't use it, you're going to lose it or whatever. So I'm looking for the exact quote because it was a good one. In the same way that we have to spiritually grow, we have to shit poop out of our asshole. And I think the, the, fun, the funny thing for me there is that I talk about shit and poop and the butt because for some reason, all of a sudden it's not spiritual as soon as you talk about that. But I've said this to several, several people that have worked with me. If, if you ate a nasty, drenched in hot sauce, delicious burrito and a bottle of X-Lax and you start going and you're staring at a porta potty and you're at Coachella, are you confused as to what you should do? No, there's zero confusion. There is tactile, pragmatic, just obvious. It's kind of an epiphany. <laughs> Me, my butt, that toilet, now. No middleman, there's no thinking, it's visceral mm -hmm. it's an epiphany mm -hmm. just as if you hadn't eaten in four days and you were in a you, you, your plane crashed in the wilderness and shout out to the book hatchet love that book and now you're back to nature you're back to human life tom tom uh tom hanks cast away and you're back and you're like i'm gonna eat a burger or whatever like i'm i have an epiphany about food that i'm gonna eat i'm hungry whatever thirsty same thing uh sexually aroused very similar thing that yeah. can that can get entangled with psych, psycho identities easier than the other topics though because the other topics are more so private bodily technical technical um housekeeping that's not really they don't function. sort of involve another human or a persona that's required to express it to other people as a person as a person identity in society because that's a key it's a key phrase sexual identity is actually predominantly related to your social identity as expressed in society so it's it's only through the ego some sometimes unfortunately it's, it's the way that it is so gravity drops the bowling ball into the center of the you put a bowling ball on the edge of a trampoline zoo, it's gonna drop into the center yeah it's not confusing if you understand this, the nature of this trampoline yep so in the same way spirit in the same way spirit is pulling on your soul to grow up the spinal column and mature into higher, more evolved states of consciousness. Interesting. And that in the same way that you got to poop that shit out your ass, you have yeah. to grow as a soul into more mature usage of your energy. So how can you, how can we leave, how can you leave me with this? And then your viewers by, you know, by association, how can we make as functional as it is to go find a porta potty at Coachella when you got a shit how can you make it as functional to actually heed that very natural thing of being pulled by spirit? How can you be as functional in that regard in your daily life? How can we get to the point where it becomes as instinctual what we have to do to go to spiritual growth as it is for shitting at Coachella? I can't believe I just asked that question, but go I yeah. Love it. Go yeah, yeah, my favorite question all day. <laughs> Violently measure your private levels of fulfillment. 
with all aspects and sectors of your life. And I say violent because nighttime is violent to daytime. Clarity is violent to confusion. A nice thick burrito is violent to starving hunger. Um, the booster is violent to coronavirus. Just kidding. No. Is that, I don't know if it is there. Um, but these things that are the remedy or these things that are the con contrasting perspective, you know, in, in filmmaking and storytelling, you got to rise up and you got to fall down. The, the mountaintop is a quote unquote violent contrast to the bottom of the valley, which if you're walking, I mean, your, your legs are going to start hurting from the walk from the valley to the top of the mountain. Your legs are hurting, your, your muscles are being used. And in a way, your disregard for gravity because of your walk and your, your determination to get to the mountaintop, your disregard for that resistance will create a kind of, um, I mean, a bench press. You know, a dude doing a bench press is violent. Running a marathon is fucking violent. I, I've been using this word violent lately because I think it's, it kicks you into this awareness that um, this and this do meet and they meet sometimes here and it's not always cookies and, and hush puppies. So you, you asked for the practical thing by looking really, really, and I say violent and I'm being silly in that way. Maybe that didn't joke. That joke, joke didn't go over as well as the butthole joke. Probably not. Um, but looking, uh -huh. but re looking really privately. That was at, me last week, Joe. Thank you, thank you. No. Um, tough crowd tonight. I'm not sure. Um, looking really, really closely at your degree of fulfillment mm -hmm. and noticing where this thing called FOMO is. Mm -hmm. If someone's really successful and they feel like their heart is not fulfilled because they don't have a, a partner. You got money in the bank. You know, start, start, start putting yourself into into a position open to love. If you you you're satisfied in love and you're really feeling like you're not fulfilled in in money, man, start looking at your entrepreneurial etc. You're really satisfied with the physical world. You got the partner. You got the thing over the you know the Jeep Grand Cherokee or your you know skydiving lessons and groceries and then man, my spiritual life just wants more. It's always showing up in the mirror of your sensory awareness. Say that again. That what, last... in, what information is relevant for your growth is always showing up in the mirror of your awareness. And I say awareness because where you point your awareness, this is a, this is a funny thing. Um, Okay, so uh, maybe you don't need to turn around, but in your field of vision, and it's maybe, maybe be funny if you don't have to move your eyeballs at all, but without moving much, be aware of something in front of you that's fragile, that if you were to throw it at the ground, it would break. Mm -hmm. okay. Got that? Mm -hmm. Now be aware of something that would, you'd throw it at the ground and you actually wouldn't care that much. Does it have to be a thing my field of vision or just another thing? Boom, there you go. Now you've already bypassed your field of vision and you're temporarily focused body mind and you become aware of something that you would throw at the ground that's maybe not ready right here in front of you, but you've also now been aware of a contrasting spectrum of something that you would throw at the ground and not care about and something that's maybe precious and you throw at the ground you really care about. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm building up a, a point as to show you the faculty that just did that for you. You have an, you have an automatic faculty that scans at the speed of light, your relative relationship with anything that can arise in your awareness. Now, um, uh, be aware of something that would be really soft to, to sit on and be snugly on. Okay. Now be aware of something that would be absolutely horrendous to be snugly on. Okay. Uh, be aware of a, a precious baby that you want to be very precious with. And I mean, it's the most incredibly precious thing you could possibly be ha have in your arms, right? Mm -hmm. It's a baby holding a puppy. Okay. Um, now be aware of a punk rock mosh pit 
with a bunch of people wearing all black and lip liner and eyeliner. Yeah. Now be aware of uh, an industrial style kitchen at like a really successful restaurant and people are chopping knives everywhere and stuff. Mm -hmm. Do you want to take the baby to the snuggly place, the mosh pit or the kitchen? Snuggly place. Why? It's comfortable. But why would you associate that baby with a comfortable snuggly place? Why wouldn't you associate that baby with like knives or like, you know, danger, uh, discomfort. Now what danger. faculty, what faculty in your system yeah. just did that for you? Cause you didn't, I didn't see you calculate nothing. My brain. Was it? I think so. Maybe. So in this exact same way to whatever thing that I just helped yeah articulated and looked at it pointed at we didn't really point at it but it just got pointed at yeah that same thing is happening for everyone with their bowels when they have to poop and that same thing in their heart when they have to grow calling it so hard for people to listen to their heart though because most are caesar's citizens and they're shown the value of belonging as being more important than the value of belonging to the kingdom. What do you say to people that maybe feel like, all right, you're fucking right, Rocco. Like my heart feels like it needs to take a shit, quote unquote. Let's just say that, right? Fantastic. But it doesn't know where the bathroom is. It feels like what you're saying. It feels like it's got to grow. It's got to do something different, but it doesn't know where to, what to do. What does it need? What do you say? So you're saying take stock privately in how you're feeling on your own about certain things and let that be your guiding post to what those are, those, that thing might be, how you're responding to things, your natural instinctual response to things should be telling you what you, your heart needs most. Is that, is that essentially, am I summarizing you correctly? Ooh, do yes. I get a visual? Do I get a visual? Yes. Yes. I would say yes, a hundred percent because um, taking stock means reflecting. If you have if you have four hundred cattle in the in the yard in the you know you're a cattle herder you're a cowboy or whatever you got a bunch of cattle but you're actually not sure but it's your business and your livelihood what you got to do you got to count them suckers you ever watch Yellowstone great show I need to I hear it's great I haven't I'm plugging this in because I need to charge before it Taking stock is what? Journaling is what? How come you're, how come you're so, ma ma man, Matthew, Matthew, you're so self-aware. What's something that you do to develop your self-awareness? I bet you Matthew says journaling is one of them. Just started my, uh, just started my 2022 journal. Hey. I, do, I do a new moleskin every year. Sounds like a reflective kind of guy if he's taking time to make yeah. a new journal. So, so to zero point into that. What is taking stock? It is reflecting. And most are only reflecting information, sensory input, and identity complex, complex freaking virus chaos. It literally, they're meant to be traps because the most mineable thing, mine like coal, mine, coal, coal, mine. The most mindable thing in this universe and all universes is the soul of any living sentient being. It is the most valuable thing. The most valuable thing in existence is life itself. So what is the primary faculty of life itself? That's that. So taking stock means taking stock on you. But what's that mean? Your bank account? Because that's what an accountant does. No, nah, bro, I'm talking about something different. Well, what about when you go to the trainer and you work out? You're taking stock on what? Your calves and your hamstrings? No, nah, bro, I'm talking about something different. We're not talking about physical or mental dimension of life. We're talking about looking in to something that isn't as gross. It's more nuanced and it's more subtle. And it's, and it's, a, it's a dimension of life that takes gracefulness. And it takes a sincerity. I had a teacher one time say, sincerity is the key to all the doors you seek to walk through. And it's that, man, if you're sincere, you'll find it. 
if you're faking sincerity because you like the identity that comes with being spiritual or the identity that comes with being sincere, that's not sincerity. That's bullshit sincerity. But uh, to answer your question more, more quickly, which I'm practicing in 2022, um, it's a journaling technique that comes from the incredible ancestry of the Japanese lineage, from what I understand. It's called the Ikigai. Mm. I-K-I-G-A-I. And at least that's how I've been shown to pronounce it. And it's a series of... What you're good at, what you're... Those things where they intersect, right? Is that it? What you're good at, what you can get paid for, what the world needs. Um, and let me just put it on Ikigai. Uh, just type in icky guy on google and you'll see this beautiful multicolored thing yeah your vocation what you love what you're good at uh what the world needs a profession what you can get paid for what you love mm. but then in there you'll see these pockets which are actually traps because there's a pocket where it's delightful and provides fullness but no wealth can't really get paid for that shit, but you love to do it. Mm. And then there's a pocket that says, yeah, it's satisfactory, but the world don't really need it. And you'll start to feel useless. Um, another pocket that says it'll provide comfort and it'll keep you kind of stable because it'll provide money probably, but you'll feel empty. Mm. So then go to a, a, a Sanskrit Hindu yogic journal technique called the purusha arthas the purusha arthas call it the four aims and it's very specific it says you knock these four things out you'll have fulfillment what they say fulfillment in the worldly fulfillment is kind of like we talk about maslow's hierarchy of needs once you knock out clean water now you can start talking about organic shit now you can start talking about more efficient systems and stuff but if we don't have freaking organic i'm sorry if we don't have clean water we're not talking about freaking GMO, nothing. I don't give a fuck if it's GMO or if it's DMO. It's, exactly. I need my life alive before I can talk about refining my life. Yeah. I need my life. Uh, and this is also a mirror of how the chakras are, which is also just a mirror of the organs of the physical body. You know, brain function is pretty reliant on gut function. Yeah. People, right. people talk about intermittent fasting and it's and its benefits on cognitive function and when to drink coffee or not to drink coffee or all these science you know call it health hacking and stuff like that biohacking shout out to dave asprey um people really getting into the science of of uh called biohacking because certain elements of food ingredients literally stimulate the body in cognitive mental mind function into more upper well, octave and I mean, you said literally you're following your gut. You have a gut mind, right? And you have a, mind, a head mind. The two are in communication with one another. Yes, yes. So to that degree, Purusha Arthas, uh, Dharma is your physical worldly purpose. You show up on an everyday basis. You've got to spend time every day doing something. You're probably going to need to get money. So you probably need to do something that's going to be fulfilling, but also of service because you'll definitely get paid for it. Yeah. But then you want comma. Comma is... I always get comma and Arthur backwards. Comma and Arthur. I might be wrong, but it's one of the two. Comma is your, you have physical desires. Like, yeah, I ride a bicycle, but I'd really like a car. Man, I'll get you a car. Well, I need to get money for that. All right, well, do your Dharma. Do Dharma. Dharma, get money, get comma. Comma gets you, get you some physical worlds, worldly stuff, because it's your physical worldly things that you need. And comma and Arthur are different between, one is just about, uh, your physical worldly needs and like possessions and like, I want a house, but I want a house with like a nice view. I want, uh, you know, a bathroom, but I want a bathtub. Um, it's like physical worldly things, but it's also your desire for, you could potentially say it's just, it's beyond baseline needs and it's actually moving into satisfaction. And then the other one is, is experiences. So I want a meaningful relationship. I don't technically need that, but I want a meaningful relationship. I want, uh, you know, I want to be able to travel the world. I don't physically need that shit, but I want that shit. That that's also technically just as primary as you know, clicking into what you're meant to do. But it's it's not out of order. You can't have. And then the last one is liberation. You can't have liberation if you don't know what you're doing with your every single day life. And you're definitely not going to get any kind of money or wealth if you don't know what you're doing with your physical everyday life. And you're definitely not going to be able to spend that wealth on and satisfactory experiences 
unless you know what you're doing with your everyday life. And then you're definitely not going to build up to full liberation of any need for anything because you have everything that you could possibly want without knowing what you're doing every day. So there are systems that can give someone super clear, functional, practical, tactile clarity as to what to do with that quote unquote bent up poop in your soul that wants to be shit out. Does that, does that, does that pass the baton? Does that answer that specific? I just, I think with that just needs, we just need to flush that and, and call it. Well, that's good. Pretty good. We, we did a solid, that's almost two, that's almost two total. Yeah. Two, two hours total. Oh, that's three hours. Bro, oh. we started, we started at six. It's oh, shit. Well, wow, that's fantastic. It makes sense for you. I, lose time. Amazing. I was going to say, like, are people going to listen to this? Well, e even if they don't, even if no one ever listens to the full thing, which I, I doubt it. I, I, I genuinely feel like even in 10 years, I'm going to be mentioning this conversation I had. Episode seven of our fucking podcast with Matt Thompson. You guys got to shut up. You got to so, check it out. We'll if see. you stuck in this long, you win a prize. And Rocco will let you know what that is. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. scan the QR code. Some, But even if not, there's so many little snippets that we're going to edit into little clips and, and oh, spread those out. And that's alchemy in itself. So, Man, I thought I, this, was, this was so good for my soul. Thank you. Likewise, bro. Thank you. I love the different angles that we point each other in. Every time. It's a dance. Every time. Um, Just Matthew Thompson, thank you for your time, your energy, your love, your attention, your embodiment, and your dharma. And um, is there anything you want to point anybody into who's listening um, into what you're doing or where they can find stuff or stuff that you want to point awareness towards or anything like that in closing? Yeah, I'm gonna do I'm gonna do better this year about keeping my website updated with new work. So you can just go to thompsonfilm.com and you can see some of these, you know, I kind of post some of the projects that are coming soon up there and trailer for the food documentary that that should be dropping. Um, probably end of this year. Will will that be coming out? Probably probably late fall, it's looking like. Um, and then a couple others there's a lot of stuff cooking this year so yeah go to the website if you want to if you're interested to see anything or any of the past work and then um my instagram which if you want to see me post once every i don't know two months you can go to at matt tomp m-a-t-t-t-h-o-m-p and uh yeah i don't know what to do about instagram i just like i don't know about instagram I feel you. I'm in a. You're reaction. so good at it. What do you mean? You're good at it. You you keep the. I know what you're thinking every day. You're <laughs> very good. I know what's going on in your mind. I like have random spurts of like, ah, oh, this. I'm gonna share this. This is my home. <laughs> I I I appreciate you saying that, and I do have fun with it. And um, I feel like in the past three or four months, I've seen this like significant drop in like interaction. Um, like I'll pour my heart into a post and like seven people will, it exists and, you know, it's a, you know, it only gets that much, whatever attention. And it has made me really look at like, what am I using this platform for and how much of it is reliant on the other end of the screen or the other side of someone else's interaction, as opposed to me just flushing this light, flushing this energy for myself. And then the way that Belp uses her social media has honestly been super recalibrated because she storytells without storytelling and she preaches without preaching. She embodies it rather than, you know, says too much. Yeah. Uh, well, so. and, you know, so many people too, I think are like really passive absorbers and they're not active absorbers. You know, I think a lot of people probably know, like if you were to walk, run into them, people know you now, like they know your heart. They might not know what to say back to it because you express at a level that I think is not the, it's not like, it's not at the level where like you post something about a sports game and somebody can easily respond and be like, yeah, dude, great game. You know what I'm saying? Like what you post is don't think is an easy expression for somebody to, unless they're that tuned in with themselves and then they can like, but I think people receive you just because they might not communicate back to you. I think they're always receiving. I'm always receiving you. You know Which, what I mean? That, that's also been another calibration for me is like, I don't want to talk to everyone. I'm actually now zeroing in on mm. a really specific person because now also seeing Instagram as like multi-layered of like exhibiting work, but also magnetizing clients yeah. and magnetizing collaborators. But then also 
I look at my shit. I'll go back a couple of years sometimes and be like, what was going on this day, that, that year? Um, and also I love, it happens sometimes. Like I did Alex Jones podcast with pops earlier last year and like 50 new people were like on and some there's a couple that went to like they liked pictures that were from 2012 so I was like damn someone scrolled but I love that I love that feeling of like wow they want to they want to know what led to this because this looks like this so I look at it as also as like I might print this shit out and like it might be a book or it might be an interactive kind of something else at some point. You're more than anything, your social media strikes me as almost like a time capsule scrapbook. You know what I mean? Like you, yours, you really could like what Frank Ocean has put out, like things where you could literally just like, you could print out all that, put it in a fucking, you have a, you have a, you know, child someday and you're like, you want to know what your father was like in his twenties. You know what I'm saying? Like you got that going for you at least, which is, which is pretty dope. Uh, it's, I, I get DMs from UFO people a lot that, are, I, love that. Like, I need to talk to you. And I'm just like, I'm the wrong guy. Like I respect everything you're going through. I know it feels lonely or scary or exciting and all these things. I, I'm, I don't know. I don't think I'm the right person, you know, to receive that energy but i'm i am the right person to one day put something out that i think at once can speak to all those people that's what i've been working on lately this year i got a, i got a new project coming that's a two new projects coming that are ufo related and it's my attempt to answer all those things but i can't be a individual sort of conduit for some of that and it's know? not your bliss or calling either it's just yeah it's just not but it's it's it, it reinforces how anytime somebody experiences something extraordinary, they feel like they're on an island sometimes, you know. And what I hope the storytelling coming soon, my own storytelling included, helps to remythologize is the concept that you are not on an island when you experience something extraordinary. And that past fear comes confusion, but past confusion comes wonder. And this is the hero's journey for every person. And when you experience these things, just know that is anything new in life like that. And I really believe we need more mythologies that encourage that because we might come to a very big realization understanding as a civilization that, you know, we're not alone and we need better stories to prepare us for that in a way that's like empowering and that's okay. And that's like, and I'm not trying to say, you know, tall whites or small grays are about to peer around the corner here. I'm not going to comment on the specificity. But I just think in general, it's fair to say we don't know everything and we're going to learn some new stuff and we got to be okay and ready for that. And we not, can't fucking implode the minute that happens because then the joke's on us and then we really are weak, you know, and we're not as strong as I think human beings can be when we're all together and we all like come together in love and in grace and in humility. So anyway. Uh, yeah, so that project will be coming soon. I hope that can, uh, I don't know. I don't know. That was a be great happy. outro. That was a great outro moment. Well, I love you. And I thank you. And give my best to your family and to Belle. And, uh, and Malachi. And Malachi. I haven't met him. Man, you will. He's, Malachi? It's so funny. People keep thinking he's a girl. But no, he's a, he's a dude. He's a, he's a dude. Okay. He's a dude. Yeah. Malachi. I don't know what Malachi, I don't know what kind of name Malachi. Yeah, it's, it's true. It's pretty, it's pretty uh, androgynous. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, thank you so much. Truly. Yeah. From my thank heart. You. Love you. Um, I'm sure we'll Marco Polo soon and other things. Yes, sir. Love, Talk you. Soon. Bless Love you. Talk soon. Bye.